Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Mastermind Summit and Competition in the Frame of the ICT Spring 2021. This event aims to promote and spread best practices, foster emulation between entrepreneurs and VCs, and offers recognition to the best international startups of the ecosystem. Mastermind is composed of a summit together with pitch sessions to reward startups through several key categories. It's going to be the fintech, deep tech, and spa new space category this year. We will be two masters of ceremony to present you this program, and we are... Amrita Singh, Senior International Affairs Advisor from the Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce. And my name is Stefan Behrend, Head of Startup Acceleration at Lux Innovation. It is our pleasure to welcome all of you to the European Convention Center and a big warm welcome to all our remote attendees. Before we start, we would just like to say how happy we are to co-organize this event in collaboration with Far West and with the Ministry of Economy. So together with the Ministry of Economy, Lux Innovation and the Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce, we are the important start, uh, uh, actors of the startup ecosystem here in Luxembourg. In that sense, I have the pleasure to officially launch the Mastermind Summit, and I would like to welcome Cindy Teriba, Director of International Affairs, the mind behind the Go International of the Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce. Welcome, Cindy. Welcome. Introduction. Uh, so, dear guests, hello and welcome to Mastermind Summit. It is indeed my great pleasure to be here today with you physically because today it's actually my first speech in presence. So, please uh, be, be a bit careful with me because I'm shy. I've been sitting behind the screen now for almost two years. Um, and I'm very delighted also to see entrepreneurs here. And I know that very many of you are connected also digitally with us. So um, I, I'm really happy and I would like also to express my gratitude to Far West uh, for very carefully orchestrating uh, this ICT event because I know it's a huge challenge in these times to transitioning back uh, to a physical uh, event. And uh, thanks for your efforts because uh, thanks to this, we are able to finally unfold again uh, human relationships and in, uh, in inter going international and uh, uh, doing business. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, collaboration and cooperation is indeed in Luxembourg's DNA. And this is especially reflected in the Mastermind Summit because this is, in fact, uh, the result of joint efforts uh, between important national stakeholders. It's the Ministry of the Economy, Lux Innovation, the Chamber of Commerce, and its House of Startups. And today you have the opportunity, uh, it was already announced, uh, to discover numerous innovative startups, to discuss key challenges that startups are facing, and to check out new trends in uh, three key sectors that are the deep tech, the fintech, and space. And uh, moreover, we will also be presenting startup ecosystems and acceleration programs that are coming from the Europe and, uh, and the greater region. So today I would like to focus on two essential points for startups. First one is acceleration and the second one is uh, ecosystems. So when we're talking about accelerations, or you might also say scaling, uh, you need structured, a very structured approach and a very good mix of key ingredients. You need a very viable business model, which is sustainable and realistic at the time. You need a good product and market fit uh, and make sure not only the product is good, but also the timing is right and uh, that you are really ahead of your competition. You need motivated talents to build a winning team. And number four is access to capital. So again, timing is key because timely funding is necessary to achieve the development objectives uh, of your products and your solutions. Or to sum it up, with the words of Jack Walsh, he's a former CEO of General Electric, number one, cash is king. Number two, communicate. And number three, buy or bury the competition. And last but not least, talking about acceleration, and this, of course, I have to say, because I'm the Director of International Affairs at the Chamber of Commerce, is expanding your client portfolio into cross-border regions, be it European or international markets. So this is come, I'm coming to my second point, and this is ecosystems. Ecosystems play a critical role in boosting startup companies. They create a favorable. Mm. 
Welcome and ministers always have priority. So. <laughs> so, ecosystems. They create a favorable ecosystem uh, to boost startups. And um, Luxembourgish actors, I think they have really understood this challenge. And uh, we, you can see that, uh, again, uh, talking about so the, the, the major actors in Luxembourg, the, min the ministry, Lux the, the economic ministry, Lux Innovation and the Chamber of Commerce, they are very well aware of this and they have really put their efforts together to create such an ecosystem. And let me give you a few examples how startups can dock. So if you are a startup uh, in the process of founding an entity, in this case, the House of Entrepreneurship is the right address for you. Because here in collaboration with a strong network of national stakeholders, you find everything in one, in one spot uh, in, together. So the House of Entrepreneurship assists future entrepreneurs with business procedures. They help with business creation. They provide mentoring, personalized information and service on numerous business management topics, and including also the export procedures if you go, if you want to export, for example. Or if you are a startup who is looking for affordable office space, then the House of Startups is the right place for you. It hosts under one roof a wide range of incubators that is giving access to an impressive variety of acceleration programs. And this has rapidly become a very successful ecosystem enabler, federating and promoting and supporting the ecosystem in Luxembourg. And in the House of Startups, you can find, for example, the Luxembourg City Incubator, so one of the largest national incubators. And it offers bespoke support of uh, programs based for, for startups programs and, and caters to the needs uh, and uh, helps numerous startups to grow and gain also a level of maturity where they can get uh, fundraising and investment. Or, for example, you would like to venture to foreign markets, then my team and myself, uh, we are the right address for you. So in this case, I really invite you to take contact with us. And because I have in my team dedicated market specialists, and they can guide you abroad, be it in the European markets, the greater region, or also on faraway markets. And we even uh, offer tailor-made services for uh, startups. So we put in place, for example, um, a boost, uh, startup boost on, uh, on, on, on trade fairs. We also go to dedicated startup conferences and trade fairs with accompanied visits. And uh, we also teach you how to pitch your product right in an international context. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure also that uh, Michele will complement on this ecosystem when it comes also to, to other aspects of, of, of uh, completing uh, the, the, the ecosystem. So, ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, um, let me also invite you to another service that we offer from the Go International site here on this uh, very uh, summit and in this context of, uh, of ICT Spring. It's the uh, uh, B2Fair matchmaking service. And uh, it's actually offering you customized B2B meetings during the whole ICT Spring and both in digital and in a physical format. So we have been orchestrate, uh, orchestrating this matchmaking events for five years now, and we facilitated more than 3,000 co companies uh, meetings, and uh, we've, we facilitated countless partnerships through this. So in case you have not yet registered, um, I can only recommend you to do so, and simply to visit uh, the B2Fair matchmaking booth here uh, at the fair, and uh, my team will be very happy to accompany you and to guide you, and this uh, matchmaking event goes until Friday. So I would like to encourage all of you present here today and also connected with us um, to make the most out of this day. Make use of the instruments that uh, will be presented to you and um, make use of the fact that we are finally able to, to go back to, to, to physical. So I wish you a very successful participation to the Mastermind Summit and the productive face-to-face -face meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cindy. It was a pleasure to listen to you. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce Michele Gallo, Director of Digital Technologies and Startup from the Ministry of the Economy, a very strong initiator of the Startup Luxembourg, but also fit for start. Michele, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, dear startup funders, dear guests, I'm very happy to be with you this morning. Um, I really welcome you to Luxembourg and uh, to this ICT Spring where we can meet uh, in person, physically. Uh, I think this is, is extremely important and is one of the first events where our startup community, our business community, but also international startups 
can meet again physically. And I hope he is only the first one of, uh, of a series in the upcoming season. But I also know that for startups, um, this, this past year has been extremely challenging. Uh, and I'm very proud of the resilience of our startup ecosystem in Luxembourg. Startups were able to adapt, to use their innovation to really help the Luxembourg economy go through this crisis. And I have to tell you that even through this difficult period of crisis, the startup ecosystem in Luxembourg has grown. The latest mapping from Lux Innovation shows now around 500 startups in our ecosystem. So the community is growing, but what is also very important uh, on our side and for me is to look at the type of technologies that these startups are working on. Those are big data, data science, software and application, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence. I think this is really a sign that the startups are totally aligned with the objective of Luxembourg, to build a data-driven, sustainable, and competitive economy. And I'm convinced that the startup ecosystem in Luxembourg is one of the key elements that will allow us to reach this objective. Of course, we've come a long way since uh, 1998, creation of Technoport, first public incubator that is still today uh, one of the key anchor players in the incubation system in Luxembourg. But of course, uh, private sector has really helped the development. It's taken over the development of the startup ecosystem as well. In terms of incubators, we're now more than 15 incubators in Luxembourg. Most of them are private or publicly, privately uh, managed. This is also a Luxembourg specificity that works very well. Um, Nowadays, I think uh, we can say that the Luxembourg startup ecosystem is a success. Startups that are looking to develop in Europe really uh, look at Luxembourg like one of the hubs to develop their business in, Luxembourg, in Europe. Of course, we have in Luxembourg multiple advantages. Our size, our very connected ecosystem makes it uh, very easy to uh, connect with decision makers, having smooth processes with public authorities. Uh, but what is also very interesting is our multicultural ecosystem, where companies can really build multicultural, multilingual teams to really uh, sell their products all across Europe. The government uh, is, of course, always supporting the startup ecosystem, uh, making sure that the business environment is right for startups, for digital startups to flourish. We have set up a number of initiatives uh, that range from a very specific R&D and innovation grants really tailored for digital companies, digital startups, different programs, acceleration programs, networking programs, but also internationalization programs, and you will uh, hear a bit more about this this afternoon, that really are helping startups from Luxembourg develop, of course, in the country, but in Europe and even internationally. A few examples of this. Luxembourg has really invested a lot into the digital infrastructure. This is from the communication infrastructure, the data center, and lately, high-performance computing. The Meluxina High-Performance Computing Center uh, is now up and running. Uh, it was created out of a European partnership, EuroHPC, where Luxembourg was from the beginning one of the key coordinators and players and supporters uh, of this initiative. And I think you will hear a bit more uh, today in this Mastermind Summit also about the different uh, EU programs to help startups and technology uh, in Europe and in Luxembourg. Another uh, program I would like to put forward is the Fit for Start. It's our key acceleration program in Luxembourg created in 2015, more than 2,000 applications uh, from more than 80 countries. This has proved to be a success, and what we try to do in Luxembourg when we have two programs, two projects like this, is to put them together and to build synergies in order for startups to benefit from this. And so I was very happy that we were able to announce uh, this Monday that uh, the call for Sweet to Start 12 is open with a specific track of HPC and data analytics. So startups from all over the world that are working with data, big data, data analytics, HPC simulations, 
will be able to apply to our Fit for Start to benefit, of course, from the usual uh, coaching program, uh, the advice from mentors, but also from um, the great support from the HPC team, from Meluxina, LuxProvide, and also, of course, from this infrastructure that was created in Luxembourg. Of course, I think we um, are at a stage now in our ecosystem where it's time also to increase international visibility of our ecosystem. This is why just before the summer in July, we launched the web platform of Startup Luxembourg. What is Startup Luxembourg? Startup Luxembourg is really the brand of our ecosystem. It's really the brand that unites um, all the players of the ecosystem and really tries to provide support to all the startups, all the incubators, all the players that are building our ecosystem at an international level in order to really act as an amplifier for what they are doing every day, the successes that they are having every day here in Luxembourg. And I'm uh, very happy that we have a strong support network of LTIOs, trade and investment officers all over the world that are helping us to build this brand, to entrench this brand into the biggest startup hubs uh, worldwide. Uh, you probably have seen yesterday and you will see today my team presenting a number of innovation, uh, innovative startups in all the verticals we have here in, in the ICT Spring this year, coming from Brazil, Korea, Taiwan, uh, the UAE. And those are the companies that our LTIOs have helped us with their knowledge of the local markets to identify as the best of breed and of course interested to develop uh, in Luxembourg. But to come back to Startup Luxembourg, I think also for you startups that are listening to us today, that are participating to the Mastermind Summit today, uh, Startup Luxembourg is really the platform where you can learn more about Luxembourg, you can get in contact with the right uh, people, the right uh, institutions that will help you really to settle your business group very quickly in Luxembourg. To conclude on my side, uh, I would like uh, to congratulate the, the organizers of ICT Spring uh, for organizing this Mastermind Summit. I think it was uh, really um, the right decision to make this full day dedicated to startup, this Mastermind Summit. This will really help you startups to understand how you can, from Luxembourg, develop in the greater region, in Europe, and of course internationally with our support programs as well. I would like um, also to wish good luck to all the companies that will be pitching today for the Mastermind competition. Uh, I know it's always tough, the jury is, uh, is always very sharp, but I am sure you will be up to the task. Um, I would like to welcome you again, uh, startups here in Luxembourg. I'm sure that today uh, you will be able to make the right contacts that will help you to develop your business in Europe through Luxembourg. And finally, I would like to thank the startup community because it's really the startups here in Luxembourg uh, that are the driver of the development of our ecosystem and that are really demonstrating how attractive is our ecosystem for innovative technology startups to develop. So thank you very much and uh, looking forward to uh, discussing with you this afternoon. Thank you very much, Cindy and Michele. Ladies and gentlemen, what an enriching way to start this day. Um, I'm moving on to the next part of our, our program, and uh, we're moving to the first roundtable that we organized today, which is a European-focused roundtable um, entitled Boosting Businesses at a European Scale. And I'm delighted to welcome as moderator, very talented Lisa Burke, presenter, actor, speaker, host, author. Thank you, Lisa, for accepting this challenge in, last, in the last minute and uh, moderating this roundtable. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a great set of panelists with us here today. We have Mark Ferguson, the chair of the EIC Advisory Board. He's also the Director General of the Science Foundation Ireland and Chief Scientific Advisor, Government of Ireland. We have Stefano pozzi Muzzelli the head of European R&D and innovation support of Lux Innovation. We have William Yonker, the CEO of EIT Digital. A warm welcome to all of you. Uh, I'd like to invite Lisa and Stefano on stage while we connect to Mark and William remotely.
Microphone, yes, it's on. Thank you very much for the microphones. Lovely to see people in real life. Lovely to be here with you. Wonderful to have one person live. And we can see Willem Juncker behind us. I can't yet see Professor Ferguson. Mark Ferguson, are you with us too? Can we see you? from Dublin. Hello, hello there, Mark. We can see you now. Wonderful. So just to do a little introduction, it's really good to be here. I think the idea of a mastermind summit to add to everything else that Far West have organized is a fantastic initiative. And it's my great honor to be here last minute. So thank you, Amrita, for that phone call and Charlotte as well. As Amrita said, it's a round table talking about boosting business at European scale, acceleration programs and funding opportunities. Very, very important. And to introduce behind me here, you can see Professor Mark Ferguson. He has many, many jobs and so we're very grateful for your time this morning. He's the Director General of the Science Foundation Ireland and Chief Scientific Advisor to the Government of Ireland. And he is also, in the capacity of our conversation this morning, the Chair of the European in in Innovative <laughs> Innovation Council, EIC, much easier for me to say, Europe. Innovation Council, EIC Advisory Board. We also have Professor Willem Jonker, which you've seen just before Mark, <laughs> the CEO of EIT Digital. Willem, we will see you. I'm sure we'll flip to you in a moment. And here with me, Dr. Stefano Pozzi-Muccelli, Head of European R&D and Innovation Support at Lux Innovation. And we've heard already a little bit about Lux Innovation. So, as you'll all be very, very aware, for a while we've witnessed the growing gap, it seems, between Europe and America and Southeast Asian countries when it comes to producing the powerhouses, the global business brands of recent years. Why is that? Perhaps it's because we lack quick access to funding here. Perhaps it's because people don't have the same attitude to risk. Uh, perhaps it's because we don't have enough innovation. We will discuss all of these this morning. Has Europe lost its edge? Do we not have the same drive here? We're just not in the same league, perhaps. We've heard just now from Cindy Tereba from the Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce talking about the need of a very, very fulfilling startup ecosystem here. And we've also heard from Michaela Galli that... Uh, Luxembourg, the Ministry of Economy, is doing so much to support that startup ecosystem here. So I'm going to start with you, Professor Ferguson. Can you tell us why this is and how did the European Commission try to address the issues as they have seen them? I will start with you, Stefano. So we had a very interesting chat a couple of days ago, and you spoke particularly about risk-taking to me and Europe's attitude to risk. So you've lived in many countries in Europe. Tell me what you have seen and experienced and witnessed yourself as a true European. Well, it, well first, thank you very much for, for the introduction. My feeling, going around Europe, uh, being in Brussels, discussing with the Commission, uh, it's that the difference we have in Europe is that when we, we reach the level of maturity of a company around, you know, it's called TRL, Technology Readiness Level 6, roughly, where you have, um, where the company has a, a good demonstrator, there you have the problem. The problem starts then. And uh, it's about the fact that, you know, the company here a lot of uh, the companies here a lot of yes but you know it's uh, the the fact that you have you go they go to the investors and the investors say yes okay you have a great great idea you have done a lot thanks to governments thanks to europe thanks to your your private investments also come back to us when you have clients when you have uh, demonstrated more your prototype when you have you know something more tangible this is the main difference that you have in Europe compared to, for instance, to the US, to the Silicon Valley. There you go out and you find the money pretty easily. Europe, you have this, uh, it's probably in the, in, in the VCs, you know, there's the, they are more careful about risks. So they say, come back later. And that's why I think it's important the EIC, because the EIC accelerator in particular is there specifically to support companies that are hearing this yes but 
uh, in you know having a bridge to when they are ready to, to respond to the requests of the investors. Well, hopefully we can go back to uh, Mark Ferguson now to tell us a little bit more about the EIC. I can hear, hello, Willem, lovely to have hello. you. Well, <laughs> hello. Well, it's great that you hear us. It is, uh, isn't it? I assume you can hear Mark now as well. We had a lot can you hear me, Kate? Dai? Oh, great. Okay, well, that's wonderful. Welcome to you both. So I'm going to okay. go to you, Mark, first of all, okay. because I think, uh, going back to the original question uh, about five minutes ago, I want you to tell me, uh, from the European Commission's point of view, what problem were you addressing and why have you come up with this idea to help fund, in a more rapid way, the startups in Europe? So thanks very much. I mean, the European Innovation Council is addressing the problem of the gap in financing really between companies being founded and scaled up in Europe and also the gap uh, in founding the companies. So if you look at Europe compared to the US, we're pretty much on par in terms of research as assessed by citations. We're pretty much on par in terms of uh, founding companies, but we are way behind when it comes to scaling those companies. So the European Innovation Council is a new instrument designed to help uh, address that problem. And essentially, we want to work with partners. Uh, the philosophy is very much about crowding in. We want to work with the private sector. We want to work with the EIT, with the ERC, with the other e European programs. And we can explain how we're doing that. But the idea is really to uh, take a higher risk, uh, not a stupid risk, but a higher risk to crowd in investment, to allow companies to grow and scale. And there are three instruments by which we do that. Thank you so much, Mark. And throwing this over to Willem Jonker, I think you are also with us. I do hope so, that the technology here is working. Willem, can you hear me now? I can hear you very well. Can you Great, hear me? I can, and I can see you too. That's super. So I wanted to talk to you specifically about R&D. And as Mark just said, Apparently, we're on par with, let's say, America when it comes to citations in R&D. Now, we had a little chat the other day where it might be true that on citations in papers produced in academia, we're on a par, perhaps. But when it comes to IP, that's not present. And the, the R&D doesn't link up with the next stage of innovation. So tell me about your ideas there. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me here. It's really uh, an honor and a pleasure to be with you. Yeah, when we look at, at least as Mark said as well, and the situation in Europe, if you compare to the rest of the world, is that in, in the research environment, we're pretty on par. Nevertheless, there is a cultural difference, and that's what you're alluding to. So, I, I mean, as a scientist at a European academic institution, if you want to make a career, your HERS index needs to be uh, nickel, as they say in French. Uh, while if you have uh, a very good patent portfolio, probably they say to you, you should have made your career in industry. And that's that's a disconnect. Because and just to say that the Hearst Index is about paper production. Sure, and that's uh, indeed. Uh, not only the production, but also how many people uh, refer to your paper. That doesn't mean they read it, but at least they refer to it. <laughs> and uh, that uh, constitutes a famous uh, number. And this magic number is very... Uh, uh, determining your, your scientific progress uh, in your institution. So uh, what needs to be done in, in Europe is, first of all, a better connect. And, and that starts, if you want to build a company, you need an idea, a technology, a business model, you need a market, and you need people with the right mindset. And that's actually the three elements that we try to bring together in the EIT. And what we see is that this mindset issue in our R&D environments is uh, still too much focus on uh, curiosity-driven R&D, which has its place and should be there. We have the ERC, excellent instrument, should remain, should be there. However, if you have all these great ideas, we want to have impact in society, in business. And that translation is happening, but could really be enforced in, uh, in Europe and could be strengthened. And then, of course, the other topic that Mark was mentioning is that when you have these small seeds, you have to grow them. If you look, for example, in our domain, digital, if you can bring to me the digital unicorn that was established over the past 20 years in Europe, then uh, you won't bring a long list. And if you look at what happened in the US or what happened in Asia, you see that far more has been achieved there. So that building this new digital economy, these new digital players uh, with, with global impact is the mission uh, we have in front of us. 
Thank you. And turning to Mark again and Stefano, I know you know a lot about the EIC as well, so please uh, throw in any comments as they, as they come to you. Mark, um, we've heard a lot there about R&D and the gap, but I'd like to go back to what now are the pillars and the, the three points you have in place for the Europe Innovation Council. How does it operate? I feel point number one is a little bit but like DARPA, the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. Can you hear me, Mark? I can, yes. Oh, can good. you hear me? We can see you now as well. So just talk us through the main steps and the main thoughts behind the EIC, how it operates. Okay. In terms of funding, the EIC has three main instruments. The first of those is called Pathfinder. As you said, this is a DARPA-like approach. It's a European equivalent. And this is about trying to look in a top-down way at technologies of the future where Europe could take a lead. So there, it's about identifying programs. It's about catalyzing groups to come together. And it's very much at the uh, R and very early D stage of, of development. It's about trying to get into those technologies. It's done, it's managed by active program managers uh, using the DARPA-like uh, model. Um, and that's the first instrument. The second is called transition. It's what it says on the tin. It's about transitioning from uh, research uh, to innovation, from an academic program to a company, up to two and a half million. And that's really to pull through programs that may come, for example, from the European Research Council, from the great bootstrapping that my colleagues in the EIT do, from the uh, mission uh, research from uh, national bodies. That's the transition fund. And then the third instrument is the accelerator, and that's what was referred to earlier. That's the biggest instrument in the program, and that's unique. It's about blended finance, so up to 2.5 million in a grant and up to 15 million in equity funding uh, for a company. Now, that's unique. Uh, not even SBIR in the United States uh, takes equity. It's the first time that the European Commission has taken equity. And what we're trying to do there is to de-risk these high-risk companies. We want to work in partnership. We want there to be private investors. But as what was said earlier, sometimes European investors are a little reluctant. They want to wait. And so what we want to do is we want to catalyze those investors to come in. We want to de-risk by being a partner. And that's important. That's a very important strategy. So those are the three main instruments. In addition, there's mentoring, there's corporate days, uh, there's ways of trying to help the companies connect into the European ecosystem. But in funding, those are the three instruments. Very competitive. Uh, since the EIC opened in April, we've had more than 4,000 applications. But that just shows you that the demand is there. So we're really fulfilling a need. That's wonderful. The demand is always there for money. And I love the idea of uh, the de-risking, the blended finance, de-risking to the European Commission's mindset of perhaps not wanting to take on too much risk. But we'll go into blended finance a little bit more. Stefano, I want you to talk us through the process of application. If you wanted to be one of these 4,000 candidates, how do you apply? Okay, depending from where you start, uh, Professor Ferguson mentioned the Pathfinder. There's, there is a convention, sort of conventional collaborative application process. So you, you, you create a partnership with three, four, five partners uh, from three different member states. You create the project together and you submit it. It's very similar to what we, we are very used to do in, uh, since many, many years in the framework programs. Transition, again, it's a pretty conventional application. The big novelty comes with the accelerator. The accelerator is innovative by itself in the uh, commission landscape, in the commission funding program landscape. It's uh, first, the in super interesting thing is that it's supported by an AI tool, which is guiding the applicant through the process. So the applicant, it's a free, free step process, free steps process. You start by submitting a pretty short application. It's, uh, you respond to a questionnaire on this AI tool. Uh, the questionnaire is based on the Hellmeyer Catechism, which has been developed in the US in the past. Basically, it, it allows you to show the, the important element of your innovation and how this is creating a market need. The system gives you a rank, a, not, not a rank, a sort of pre-score uh, for your innovation. It says how technologically advanced, how scientifically advanced 
your application is. And this is uh, also interesting because it allows, you, it allows the applicant to structure better the project in a way that the system recognizes better. Still, it's, an, it's a set of human evaluators reading the proposal at the end. But you have this pre-score, which is scanning your proposal against patents, against project databases, and it's, uh, you know, I think it helps the applicant to structure the idea in a very coherent way. Then, if you are selected, you go to the second step. Second step is a full business plan. Again, supported on this AI platform, which guides the applicant in defining the value chain, the supply chain, uh, the, mar the, the market needs that they're addressing, how they are structuring the project. And very interesting to me here is that you have uh, this way of structuring the project in features and how these features are responding to needs. And this, I think, is very good for all the people, they, for all the startups, because sometimes, you know, they, they don't communicate the project in a, an amazing way. No? So structuring the project in this way gives them the, the possibility to think about what they are doing in a very coherent and structured approach. And then if you are selected at the stage, you go to the interview. Uh, I can tell you that there are interviews happening now in Brussels at, the, at, the, at this moment, and uh, we will see how they go. And, um, well, it's lovely to hear you're using AI there in the screening process. I, I don't know how the algorithm works, but let's hope it's, it's a very good one and, uh, and, and very novel approach as well. But another thought that sometimes occurs when we hear Europe in the same sentence is bureaucracy and time and how long it takes. So, Mark, turning to you, for the funding, for the scale-up, the time scale compared to Asia, Southeast Asia, America, are we, are we behind the time scale with the EIC? So the aim in the EIC is to go from application to money in the bank for successful applications in a time frame of between six to nine months. And that's six months, you know, is best practice anywhere in the world. It's also best practice in the private sector by the time you do due diligence and so on. In the pilot phase, we did not do that. Well, obviously, we had to scale up. Um, in the early days, we're getting close. I mean, I have to say the number of applications is much higher uh, uh, than, than we really were expecting. Uh, but nonetheless, that's the aim. It will happen. Um, it will happen that we will be absolutely competitive uh, with best practice around the world. And it's to streamline the bureaucracy. You know, these applications are important. You do have to do due diligence. That's what the private sector does. And we've also introduced a fast track. And, and basically, fast tracking becomes really important. So the fast track may be because somebody else has done some of the due diligence elsewhere in the European programs. And it may also be because the private sector has done quite a lot of that due diligence and we don't need to repeat it. So fast tracking is also an important uh, strategy. And then lastly, we in turn are fast tracking within the European programs because I told you that there are a very large number of applications. The success rate is quite low as a consequence of that, but there is a seal of excellence program. And what that means is if you've been approved for funding by the European Innovation Council, but you fell below the threshold where we had budget uh, in order to fund, uh, then member states can automatically fund out of the structural funds without any further uh, evaluation and without breaching state aid rules. And that's really quite important, uh, particularly for the more developing countries within the European uh, uh, Union. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to be very efficient. We're trying to be completely compatible with the private sector and with best practice internationally. And I hold my hand up in the pilot program. We didn't do that, um, but we've learned from that uh, and uh, we've improved the processes. Well, that sounds like the, the point of having a pilot program. So <laughs> congratulations in uh, changing according to the results you found. Willem, I haven't forgotten about you. Turning to you now, I'd like you to explain to us, if I can see Willem, it always helps me know that he's there listening to me. Willem? I do listen. Oh, good. Uh, so I can see you now. That, that, that well. makes me feel a lot more comfortable that you can answer my question as well. I'm not just talking to the ether. Um, I want you to tell me a little bit more about EIT Digital, and we will get into deep tech, because another thought I have is if you are one of these more advanced startup companies and you're really involved in your work and your research and what you're doing and you're thinking about all the different stages you have to come, there, there are actually a plethora 
of options available out there within one's country, within the European Union, the European Commission. So how do you find the right place to go? And for you at EIT Digital, who do you want to come to you? What do you do? Well, the, the approach that we take is uh, what we call an innovation funnel. And we have three phases. Uh, it's, it's first of all is identifying opportunity. And we do that in our ecosystem with our technology partners, mainly our universities, but also entrepreneurial teams that have a certain proposition. So that, that's the, the identification. We call that the stand up phase. Then the second one is the startup phase. There you are creating the opportunity so very concretely building a venture that you can then further grow and then you have the what we call the scale-up phase where we have our accelerator that's really about scaling and the way that these things are financed uh, uh, differ per opportunity and differ also the kind of technology that you have i mean financing a uh, deep tech growth uh, companies is a different story than financing uh, market-oriented platform companies that go for eyeballs because there you put your money in buying the market and expanding your uh, market while in uh, technology companies you normally invest more still in the technology itself and bootstrap out, out, out of successive versions of your technology into uh, a customer base. So that there are differences there. What for us is extremely important is the earlier you get private money on board, the better. So uh, Mark already mentioned, we have to be compatible with the private sector. Uh, I would go one step further. So we have to closely cooperate and collaborate with the private sector in order to make sure that from the get-go, there is interest and there is involvement. So if you look at our accelerator of the past eight years, we have been able to mobilize into the portfolio of those companies one billion of private investment. And that's by far more than we put in from the EIT as the public investment. And that's also the companies that you uh, see grow because as a public institution, you can you can put the preconditions, you can, you can help pushing things, but then they have to take off in the private sector. And especially if you have further investment rounds, you need the firepower of big private investment funds. So we do the preparation work. Our accelerator works in a sweet spot where it's very difficult uh, growth moment. And then it's where you need around 10 million. If you need uh, a few millions, uh, you can get it, either at a national level, if you need less than a million uh, and you have something good in your hands, there are always angels that want to support you. If you need 50 million or more, you are on the radar of the big players anyway. So you don't need our support, but it's, it's getting you from the first few million to being on the radar so that the 50 million comes towards you. And that's exactly where there is a role for public intervention and where we should uh, play and where we are playing. Thank you very much, Willem. Moving back to you, Stefano, I'd like to move from the European stage back to this country that we find ourselves in, Luxembourg, and you, of course, are at Lux Innovation. So on a country scale, what do you see happening here in Luxembourg in the startup ecosystem? And also, who do you want to come to you? Because even within Luxembourg, we have lots of different options, as has already been mentioned by Cindy this morning. I see a growing interest in European funds from our startups. Uh, this is... Uh, I. I cannot tell you how, uh, I, I don't have the number here in my mind now, but really, out of the companies that I see, most of them are startups now. Uh, I even see quite a lot of companies coming uh, from abroad to Luxembourg and looking directly into applying into the, into the accelerator. So it's really uh, attracting a lot, the, the startup ecosystem. Compared, uh, seeing how it, how it grew in the time that I've been in Lux Innovation. I've been in Lux Innovation for uh, almost five years now, and I'm following the EIC and the, the predecessor also since uh, uh, two, two and a half years mostly. And what I've seen is that the quality of the applications is always, always increasing. Um, the, the maturity of the startups coming to us 
are uh, is growing, is 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 continuously growing. Uh, I think this is also happening at European level. Uh, if I see the success rates uh, from the, from the uh, from the past programs, and if I see how many programs are how many companies are going through the first stage of the selection, it's really improving quite a lot. So the the entire startup ecosystem in, in Europe, to me, is uh, growing in terms of in, ter in terms of quality, companies that we would love to see and uh, we, that well uh, that we are seeing and that would like to see more are companies ready to the scale up. Uh, probably the EIC accelerator for probably it's a matter of communication is seen as a very uh, as a startup as a startup tool. It's not a startup tool for you know for the company which is. Uh, I, okay, I have an idea. I start the company now and, uh, and I go ahead. No, it's not for that kind of company. Th there are maybe some lucky cases where they have, you know, maybe a brilliant idea, but, uh, but you know, it's not for them. Uh, companies which, ha which are ready to see some clients, to go for some market replication studies, to have uh, first tests on the market. These are the companies that we really love to see for the EIC because uh, also because you know they have uh, a mature business plan already in their mind. Uh, they have a clear idea of the cash flow, the coherence of the cash flow, which to me is very, very important in the evaluation process. So, yeah. This kind of companies, yeah. <laughs> and moving back to you, Mark, again, it always helps me if I can see the person behind me. <laughs> can you hear me, Mark? I can, yes. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. I would like to know, uh, thinking about Horizon 2020, that report, perhaps you could talk about the pillars that were highlighted within Horizon 2020 and if they are also applied to the EIC and who you want on board, is there any, I don't like to use the word positive discrimination, but there are, are there any fundamental countries, types of people, types of projects that you are really looking to support? Thank you. So, I mean, in terms of the overall Horizon Europe program, there are essentially three pillars. One is about research, which is the European uh, Research Council. One is about missions, uh, which is about uh, citizen and corporate engagement and looking at really important challenges. And one is about innovation, and that encompasses the EIC and the EIT. So we are on the third pillar. And the EIC is always bottom up. So we will always take uh, deep tech projects from whatever country, from whatever field. There's always open uh, bottom up, but we supplement with some top down. So we supplement by identifying areas that are important, for example, green technologies, agri tech, food tech, uh, and so on. Um, uh, we pivoted in the COVID crisis. So, so there's a, a top down element. It is absolutely on excellence, on the quality of the projects in terms of their business development. However, we want to encourage underrepresented uh, groups and regions. So we're particularly interested, and we had a special initiative in female uh, founder companies, in companies that have female founders, female CEOs, uh, female directors. Females are significantly underrepresented in Europe. And actually, as a consequence, for example, uh, female products like Femtech uh, are significantly underrepresented right across the globe. We're also interested in regions and countries uh, that are underdeveloped in terms of their innovation ecosystem. So that so cities tend to be well developed and our colleagues in the EIT have very well uh, developed bootstrapping mentoring programs that we're partnering with. So these are some of the uh, new uh, uh, members of the European uh, uh, com uh, community, but they're also regions of other countries. So it's absolutely an excellence. There's no quota, there's no discrimination there, but there is positive encouragement to mentor and bring up um, uh, female-led companies, companies uh, from other regions. And you really see that, you know, if you look at the portfolio of uh, awards that we've made, and we've made about 5,700 awards, then uh, what you see is that as with a lot of the European programs, those awards uh, are predominantly in the older member states. They're in uh, countries like the Netherlands, Germany, France, uh, um, Ireland, and so on. 
But what you also see is an increasing number in the newer member states, and you see those member states really overrepresented in the approved uh, uh, proposals, but the ones that haven't yet met the funding bar. And what that says to me is that these are really good companies led by really good people, but they maybe just haven't had the mentoring that perhaps occurs in a more mature system. And so working with colleagues in the EIT plus our own uh, mentoring program, we really want to bring those things up uh, and have a very good success rate. And it's important, very important, that we work with the private sector and crowd in investment. Since foundation, the EIC portfolio has raised a five billion of private investment. That's roughly three euros for every one euro that we invest. We want that to be five to one. A five to one would be really good. Three to one is about kind of average. Um, uh, so, so with this crowding in element that I spoke about before, and let me just give you a couple of examples. I'm going to give you the good examples, obviously. Uh, but if you look at a company like Relax Solutions that we invested in, they just raised a round of 182 million euros. If you look at On Label, it just raised 83 million euros. Both of those companies are now valued about 400 million euros. And if you look at Selling, that's our first unicorn company with a valuation of over a billion euros. And that's about producing um, uh, biological sustainable ink for printers. So that gives you a kind of feel of how you can scale those kind of companies. I mean, EIC supported startups have raised the 5 billion. They've also doubled their staff in about two years. So this speaks to the kind of scaling bit. It speaks to the, to the crowding in. And, you know, ultimately, if we do our job properly, we will make ourselves redundant. Ultimately, in 10 years, the market will be so enthusiastic about all the great opportunities that there are in Europe that it won't need to be necessary to catalyze uh, those investments. That's really my aim. Uh, that's what I want to do. Uh, and we have a bit of a journey to go on that. <laughs> a little bit of a journey, but you're, you're counting down the minutes to your retirement in about a decade or so, and you'll be, you'll be very happy with all of these unicorns that you will have bred in your fields across Ireland or so. <laughs> um, I just wanted to open up the floor actually to you then. You've mentioned, you've underlined a few times the crowding in, the necessity to try to aim towards this five to one target. So as we're sitting in Luxembourg, give a call out. Who are you looking for as, as investors? And Stefano also mentioned the seal of excellence. So for a startup, an advanced startup that doesn't quite make your criteria at the EIC, how can another investor come in when it has a seal of excellence? And also, how can investors come on board to support your startups at the EIC? Very good. So there is a platform. I mean, if you go on the website, uh, you can register. There's a, a, a platform of investors who are interested in uh, seeing the opportunities that come from the EIC. We also operate networking events. So there are investor days where we will introduce on a thematic basis uh, uh, companies to investors. We also have corporate days where we do the same thing with corporates. And, and that means not just uh, corporate investment, because that's an important uh, part of the venture business, but also looking at people who might place orders, who might work with people who would be part of the supply chain and so on. So that's part of the ecosystem uh, development. Colleagues in EIT uh, do likewise. And what we're trying to do is to bring up the quality of all of those companies. Um, and also we encourage investors and companies, you know, a real sweet spot say, as a company that needs, and just make this up, 10 million, and maybe the investor uh, uh, consortium was willing to put in 3 million. And the European disease is to try and make the country, the company do uh, with 3 million, but actually it needs 10. Uh, and so that's a really interesting uh, position for us where we can catalyze and we can look. We can be the first investor. Um, uh, we're allowed to do that. If we are, we're not going to price the round. Uh, we're basically going to do that with like venture debt. Uh, and then when the private investors come on board, our uh, uh, funding uh, will convert whatever valuation they put on the company. I mean, that's something we would probably do in uh, rare occasions where we thought it was a really interesting uh, technology. It was a high risk, not a stupid risk, but we really want to do it when we've got one or two investors on board. So it's about de-risking. It's about helping uh, to put uh, the consortium together. And that may be everything from doing the due diligence for a smaller fund through to just completing the round for a larger investor who's already done the due diligence. Thank you very much. So the call out is there. All if, of you if I'm allowed, I, I would like to add something to this story, if, if possible. Of I, course. Uh, I mean, I could not agree more. 
I would also say it's extremely important that we now have this innovation pillar in Horizon Europe and that we have a couple of instruments and that these instruments work together very, very closely. I mean, that's essential to really team up and, 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 and work uh, together. I want to mention one thing which is extremely important for uh, uh, Europe and for scaling companies. And that's the talent part of the story. Of course, the money is extremely important and we talk a lot about the money and I think we, uh, we completely agree where are the challenges and how we can fuel this and also how we can attract more private money. We also need the talent and especially in the domain where we are active in digital, we need a lot of talent. And these things go hand in hand. Uh, I very often get the question, do we have to invest more in digital education, entrepreneurship, because we will have more talent? And my answer is, of course. However, if you create talent, but you don't have the attractive business environment where that talent will then end up and work in those ecosystems, you will probably be the education house for the rest of the world, and you will not be able to keep that talent in Europe. And that's what we need as well. And especially in digital we need to build this new industry because talent wants to work with top-ranked companies that have a global impact. And therefore, I would make a strong plea in, in, in this whole innovation uh, 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 pillar to make sure we get the talent element stronger embedded. Uh, it's a bit the risk what you have when you build pillars in, in the program. Yeah, We have Horizon Europe. We say, okay, there are the scientists. There is Marie Curie. They take care of the talent. Uh, then we have uh, the partnerships that sit in pillar two, and they will take care of the incumbent uh, uh, progression and, let's say, the non-disruptive uh, innovations uh, or what have you. If I say that, they will probably hit me on the head. And then we have the innovation pillar where the new and brilliant are coming up. These worlds are not disconnected. I mean, innovation is not a linear process. There are backs and forths. There are parts where you need to, need to do some additional research. That's why a lot of companies have research facilities. So, so you are in these different phases at, uh, at different points during your journey. And I think that's another thing that we should keep an eye on and make sure that it's great. We now for the first time have an innovation pillar and it was absolutely needed. And we have to work together in that pillar to strengthen it. But we should not forget to very well connect to the other two pillars that are also in the horizon, Europe, because otherwise we will be on an island. And especially we will miss the connection to, to the talent, to educate them, but also to embed them in these ecosystems and keep them in Europe so they are contributing to the European development. Well, that was wonderfully put, and we'll focus still on this because I know one of the parts of your digital world is deep tech. So just explain to us firstly, Willem, what is deep tech? What do you mean by deep tech? So our definition of deep tech is that this is technology-based innovation. You have business model innovation, you can have design-based innovation, you can have technology-based innovation. And technology-based innovation has two, two, uh, two of a kind. You have the incremental uh, next generation uh, innovations and you have the dis disruptive innovations. Yeah? If you go from a, a, a vinyl uh, to a compact disc, uh, to online uh, Spotify, you have disruptions. I mean, the, the use is the same. However, the delivery technology is completely different. If you go from, from 3G to 4G to 5G to 6G, you see a more evolutionary path. Of course, there are some disruptions in it as well, and it, it, it makes you being able to do more things, but that's a different uh, uh, nature. So that are the two technology-driven innovation uh, that, that you have. And, and typically those innovate, if you see in Europe, uh, we have one company that's an extreme good example of this technology driven innovation, that's ASML. Yeah, so that's the, the most valuable European company in the digital domain. And that is a company that builds the core technology to print chips in the semiconductor industry. So we really have a control point there. And that's a company that is really deep tech innovation. So it's really based on scientific research. And the advantage of deep tech is that the barrier to entry is very high. 
uh, a design can be copied. So you have to make sure your trademarks, your design IP is well in place. Otherwise, they are making uh, uh, copycats and, and you are in a vulnerable uh, area. So deep tech has quite a few advantages. However, it took ASML 30 years to get where they are. So deep tech normally also has a different investment round. It has a longer uh, road uh, uh, to go. If you look in, uh, at, at Facebook, the big growth of Facebook, there was of course preparation work and all, but, but really when it took off, it's about seven years. Uh, and if you compare that to a deep tech innovation, you see different things uh, uh, happening. Uh, so that's actually where we are focusing. And that means that you finance it differently that also the hockey sticks are, uh, of course, what investors would like to see, that the hockey stick takes off after two years and makes you filthy rich. Uh, maybe you will get filthy rich or not, but at least you contribute something to society if you invest in deep tech, because we're getting forward. But th those roads are, on average, longer. Uh, but again, what you get back for that is, of course, a higher uh, barrier to entry, because it's not so easy to copy. If you see, for example, in semiconductors, Europe is struggling with its position uh, there. We have a, a, a few good control points. We have iMac as really the design center of the world for the next generation of semiconductor technologies. We have ASML as, as a key player, but we don't have the production facilities because they are in Asia and in the, in the US dominantly. So we miss part of the whole chain uh, uh, there. And that is where you have to look at when, you, when you're doing uh, 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 deep tech and you see how how difficult it is to enter. Because if you look at the geopolitical level, China is trying to catch up in the semiconductors and throwing a lot of money at it, but they're still not on par after 20 years of throwing enormous amounts of money into this deep tech. So deep tech is a different game than a platform. There is a Tencent, there is an Alibaba, uh, but there is no competing ASML. And, and we can benefit from that because we have such a strong research foundation in Europe. And th we should do more with that, really. <laughs> well, you've explained that very nicely because I wouldn't have necessarily guessed that we had any advantages on that front here in Europe when I can see certain powerhouses, unicorns in America and Asia. But I'm glad you explained that out to me. It's good to hear that. And it's good to hear also your positivity. But just to rewind to a point you mentioned earlier, and it's one we haven't yet focused on, and it's that link between education and here, it's across Europe. Your and of course, every education system in the various countries are not equivalent. Even within the one country, they're not equivalent, in fact. So, Europe-wide, do we have a strong enough education system, a strong enough university system to support the digital future that you're talking about? And I, I throw this question open to anybody who wants to dive in. Yeah, well, I, I must say, uh, indeed, I, I mean, as with many things in Europe, the situation is pretty fragmented and university uh, systems are either a national uh, um, responsibility or even a regional responsibility. If you look in Germany, for example, the lender are uh, responsible for uh, the university. So they differ also uh, uh, across the country, from Bavaria uh, to uh, Hamburg, uh, you see different way of uh, how the universities are managed. Uh, that being said, at the European level, of course, we have uh, DG EAC, which is, is, is working on education uh, and also on harmonization. Uh, so in the, the BAMA model, bachelor master model, we're trying to harmonize uh, uh, at least... Uh, uh, the curricula more, and, and we are working on that as well. So we, we have a European uh, a master program, a two-year master program with 20 universities across Europe, where we have a uniform master program. And that, of course, facilitates mobility. And I think that's the, the, the most important thing. Harmonization is important to facilitate mobility. I mean, it's not harmonization, it's not a goal in itself, but it makes it easier for students to take part of their education outside their own country. And, and that's, of course, in a global connected world, extremely important. And that's why Marie Curie programs are, are focusing on that. But it should start earlier. It should start in bachelor and master level. And that makes sure 
you have then to make sure that these systems are compatible because otherwise you end up without a diploma or a certificate and then, then you, you are not attracted to take that risk to go to another country. Well, it enriches you enormously. So there are steps being uh, uh, made. Uh, it's, it's a complex process uh, because uh, universities have a rich uh, history, uh, which sometimes, in all honesty, also gets a bit in the way. And uh, But you see uh, an uptake and you also see an uptake on entrepreneurship. So in, uh, increasingly, universities recognize valorization. Most of them still work in the von Humboldt model of combining education and research and valorization and entrepreneurship is an add-on. And I think the challenge is to make it a solid third partner in uh, future uh, uh, universities. And, and there, of course, we can, uh, I work a lot together with MIT, uh, uh, even today, uh, and, and in the past with Stanford, with Berkeley. And we can still learn something from the university models we have there. Although in the UK, if you go to Cambridge, uh, for example, you see also excellent examples how the three pillars can be a good basis for a, uh, a, an impactful uh, university ecosystem. Thank you, Willem. I think, Stefana, you had a point to add. Uh, yes, you know, um, Marie Curie, Marie Skrodowska Curie actions have been mentioned uh, earlier. And this is very important also, you know, because you have uh, doctoral training, postdoctoral training. You know, it's really encouraging mobility around, around Europe. Uh, there's, there's a rule. You have to move to another country to do your Marie, Marie Skodowska Curie uh, funded postdoc or doctoral training. Uh, but as Willem said, you have to get to the point of having a doctorate in the first place. So perhaps it should be brought forward <laughs> to know, the bachelor's know, it's, level. <laughs> there are these doctoral yeah. programs which are uh, collaborative with industries also. So... Uh, yeah, of course, you have, but you also have the Erasmus program where you can have uh, collaboration between first mobility, but also collaboration for joint, uh, joint uh, master programs between, between different universities. Uh, it's, you, we can do more, I'm sure, but uh, systems are, in, are getting there. There was, for instance, uh, it closed recently, there was a call for proposals for an HPC master. So a uh, joint master program for HPC. It was funded by what Michele mentioned earlier, the uh, Euro HPC joint undertaking. They had this call for proposal and we are expecting the results uh, in few, in I think two or three months we will have the results and we'll see who won this uh, HPC master. Well, I've got two minutes left. So firstly, I just want to say thank you to all of you for staying here listening in real life, to those of you online. And I'd like to give you all about 30, 40 seconds each to give us a final thought, a final word. What are the good things? What are you optimistic about? And, and what are you hoping for for the future? So I'm going to turn to you first, Stefano, actually. Ooh. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> I was looking away. Just. <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> so uh, my, my message is really to the startups here in Luxembourg, to the startups that are willing to relocate to Luxembourg, come to us. Uh, we are there to help them. This is very important. Uh, we, are, we are doing a, a, a really, a, well, big job with them. I don't know when it will pay off hopefully uh, soon, but really we try to work a lot with them. So please come to us, come and see us. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's my final word. Thank you, Stefano. Willem, to you, any optimistic message in your hopes and desires for a successful European future? Yeah, it's risky to give people one minute because you know how this works, but I will keep it very short. So 30 seconds when now. I look, when I look at... <laughs> My area, I think the, the situation has never been better to really make a big step in digital innovation in Europe. The awareness is there. The political will is there. It's a top priority for member states and the union. And the instruments are there. So it's, it's, it's now really a matter of rolling up our sleeves and making things happen. Meaning we have to make sure that the financing is there. We have to make sure that the talent is there and we have to make sure that the innovation community is really teaming up because really the preconditions have never been better than today. Mark, the very final word to you. 
Thanks very much. So, so I would say uh, that this is the most exciting time ever to be alive in research and innovation. And it's also a time when there are very significant problems to address climate change, feeding the world, and so on. So Europe has the opportunity to do responsible innovation and to solve important problems in innovative ways. And I think there's a huge opportunity for young people uh, particularly uh, to uh, do very cutting edge research, uh, to translate that into companies, to do good for the planet and to make money at the same time. And what could be better than doing cutting edge research doing good for the planet and making money. That's a fabulous thing for anybody to do for the future. Perfect. Perfect timing, all of you. Thank you so much. And I hope you all have a wonderful day and I hope you have wonderful projects coming your way in the near future. Thank you all. A startup coming to Luxembourg, it's very easy to develop your project and then afterwards go international. Go to other countries because Luxembourg is very small in its only market, but you have a very direct access to like the neighboring countries, but to every other country in Europe too. All actors of the startup ecosystem in Luxembourg are working hand in hand in order to strive for the same goal. The unique characteristic of the startup ecosystem is that it is a really closely knit ecosystem that fosters collaboration between the different stakeholders, private as well as public. And thanks to its small size, it really helps you to test your solutions, to get quick feedback and to have short ways to key decision makers in the market. You can get an answer from the relevant people very quickly, which is the key element for a startup and, and the localization. The key things are within 10 minutes from our office, um, and that's great. Luxembourg is very open to the world. It's a very international country where connections are easily made and also easily made with the other countries around Luxembourg and even beyond uh, Europe. I think we are getting to a point where we can aim to challenge the first in class and be actually the top contender. In terms of financing, we've got it pretty much all covered. Some very cheap options in terms of office for free top-notch uh, acceleration and coaching, all the way to state-backed subsidies and grants, business angel financing, VCs, you name it. In Luxembourg, compared to other cities around the world, we don't take equity. So if you have a funding from, from the Ministry of Economy, they don't take equity. It's a fast funding and uh, easy to go uh, from here. There's an energy that permeates the ecosystem here. It makes everyone excited, including me, to wake up every morning knowing that we can achieve things. Ladies and gentlemen, and here we're back. What a nice round table, food for thought, food for thought for us as ecosystems and food for thought for all companies, for all startups. So we're here moving on to the next uh, chapter of the Mastermind Summit today. And the next one is focused on a highly relevant topic, how to build unicorns. And it gives me great, great pleasure to welcome Jerome Vitama, tech investor, entrepreneur, and co-founder of Expon Capital to join me on stage. Jerome has been a tech investor and entrepreneur for decades now, prior to founding Expon Capital and investing in a new wave of high impact tech firms, he invested early in firms that became world leaders in their field. He focuses today on deep tech across AI, big data, agri-tech, climate, energy, digital health, and new space applications. Jerome, the flow is all yours. Hi everyone, how, how are you doing today? Good, great, thank you. Uh, and I'm saying hi to the uh, audience there. Uh, I don't know wherever you are, uh, big uh, shout out from Luxembourg. 
Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, how to build a unicorn. So I guess, uh, you know, everyone's got heard a lot about, uh, you know, new unicorns being created every single day. And you know what it is. It's, you know, defined as any firm that's uh, uh, reached a valuation of more than a billion dollars or euros. And, um, well, I guess you didn't know these uh, statistics that you're seeing on the screen. Uh, there's uh, a new unicorn being uh, minted. Uh, like every three days now, it's uh, it's become really crazy. Uh, so we're we're at around a 800 count worldwide uh, these days. There's almost 300 uh, created this year. There's new unicorns. This is not accumulated numbers. This is new unicorns. I think there's been 76 new unicorns in Europe alone, uh, and I guess you can understand that uh, most of them are being created in the U.S. Uh, but Europe, for the first time, has actually surpassed China in creating uh, new unicorns uh, this year. So uh, quite, uh, quite, quite exciting to see uh, what uh, basically my firm, we've been predicting along with uh, some uh, other VCs in Europe, that Europe would actually become a very big uh, and powerful force in this creation of a very uh, uh, striving ecosystem. Um, so, um, yeah, the idea behind this little talk is, is to share uh, a few learnings of, you know, what it takes to become a unicorn from um, the experience we've had. Uh, one, one of our partners was, was the, um, uh, the VC that, rose, that wrote the first check in one of Europe's uh, very, very first unicorn. Uh, that was last minute in 2000, became a an overnight success uh, going, uh, uh, being listed on the London Stock Exchange for more than a billion pounds uh, in, in something like three years. Uh, and he wrote the first tech, 100,000 uh, pounds back in, in, uh, in, in 2000. So that was, that was already quite something. And of course, we've seen a lot of unicorns over the years. And in my firm, we've, uh, in my last fund, we have already two, and I hope we're going to have a bit more uh, out of very few investments. So I guess uh, we're, we're being lucky here. Um, so a few thoughts about what it would, would not take to become a unicorn. Uh, the first thing is you think, okay, well, I need to have a good idea. Uh, and uh, I think that's, that's deeply wrong. You don't only need to have a good idea. The good idea is commonplace. We're going to come back to that. And then we need to grow nicely. Uh, of course, I meant this to be a little bit controversial because you can actually, uh, when you're embarking on exponential growth, you know one of the trademarks of exponential growth is you have a deceptive rate of growth. So you're like doubling every year from nothing to doubling from nothing, still nothing, and then nothing, 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 nothing. And then after 10 years, boom, you start hitting the, the hockey stick growth and, it, and then it becomes visible. Um, so you can't actually become a unicorn like that. Uh, what I mean by here, by grow nicely, is these days, uh, it's, it's certainly, uh, less, let's say, uh, uh, less fashionable to grow nicely. But I would, I would uh, uh, challenge this and say, uh, well, whatever works for you, uh, you know, try it out. Um, profitability, uh, it's also meant to be controversial, of course, in this um, day and age where the uh, U.S. culture of unicorn building means that you need to, you know, it's growing, 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 growing at all costs and not even thinking about profitability down the line. I think that's deeply wrong and that one day, you know, some firms are going to pay the price. So also think about that. It doesn't mean that you have to set your sights on being profitable in the first or second year, but what it means is you need to have your sights on how you're going to uh, extract value out of the customer equation, right? So how you are going to build unit economics that makes sense for the business. And the last uh, one, of course, uh, large funding rounds early. Uh, well, of course, uh, in and of itself doesn't make sense. Uh, it always should go hand in hand with the fundamentals of where the company is. So it's, it's very abstract and we're going to get down to uh, uh, hopefully, you know, more uh, mundane things. 
Um, so this is the exact type of sl slide that you should never do if you want to you know, do a pitch deck to raise a unicorn. Why? Because there's too much information on this slide. So it should be cut in two. The, the, the main uh, interesting thing, I think, is aim at domination. That's what, that's what matters. Aiming at domination of a market, what does it mean? It means that three things. is One, you pick an opportunity where uh, you know it's going to be extremely valuable in the future. Second, you're the only one to think that, right? So there's an arbitrage opportunity here. And the third thing is uh, you really have a strong competitive advantage in addressing that opportunity uh, as opposed to others. And of course, in what domain? Well, it's up to you, but clearly tech uh, makes up more than half of all unicorns created. So there's, uh, uh, this, there's a fertile ground there, but it doesn't mean that you can do it in life sciences. Uh, I would imagine that life sciences by the end of this century could actually account for 30% of the total count. So, um, yeah, so what kind of opportunity? There's lots of bad ideas out there, lots of them, but there's also a lot of very good ideas, right? And if you want to build a unicorn, you should not waste your time in you know, entertaining a good idea, right? Because good ideas are not conducive to creating a unicorn, right? For a unicorn, you need the great idea, the great opportunity, right? That's where you should focus your time and not on the good ideas, which are just a waste of time. Um, being an, an entrepreneur, I'm going to, you know, take a step back here and tell you, well, actually, it's just to build a unicorn. But as an entrepreneur, you don't necessarily want to build a unicorn. And that's, you know, fair enough if you want to build a company that makes, you know, uh, a few million euros in revenues and are going to grow nicely over the next 20 years. That's fine. We, we call that, that lifestyle businesses. And honestly, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it's not unicorn material, and hence, it's not VC material, right? Other thing, thinking big while executing small. What the heck does that mean? Well, as a founder, you have limited resources, and these limited resources are two things. One, it's your time, and two, it's your money, right? Um, the money will buy you uh, resources and hence time. The time is the most precious resource you have. So the smartest uh, founders we've seen and that we continue to see day in, day out, they have this very same characteristics. And these are that they can do two very paradox paradoxical things at the same time. One is to being able to articulate a very clear long-term vision of where the market they want to address is going. And two, it's to be able to execute on the short term to create and deliver value so that they can get to the seed round, to the series A, and raise successfully uh, at each step of the way. Because climbing Mount Everest is not about leaping from 1,000 uh, meters of altitude to 2,000. It's about making one step each and every time, right? One after the other. At the same time, you should have prepared in advance where you're going, which is at the very top, and then coming back, right? So you don't think about, you know, camp number three or four. That's, that's a long way. So um, because you, what you want to do is create a unicorn, uh, you need the resources to do that. And you don't build a unicorn by hiring either bad or good people. What you want also is the kind of people that are called 10Xers. They are the talent that are going to help you go that leap forward in terms of uh, uh, delivery, right? And the interesting thing uh, that uh, we have uh, remarked over the years is that typically a 10Xer is going to be very demanding 
in the same way that a low performer or an average performer is gonna be extremely demanding. So be very careful, look at the kind of people you have in your team and the kinds of people you want on your team. You certainly, because of the precious time, you, uh, limited time you have, you don't wanna waste your, uh, that time with the bad hires. So uh, all in all, there's a few traits that are uh, quite commonplace, uh, I would say, you find them in, in about 100% of unicorn founders, is that they're <clears throat> they have some kind of humbleness to them, which is not the tip, you know the kind of humbleness you would ne necessarily think about, uh, which is the social one. But is that they don't necessarily they they know that they don't know everything, so they're very curious. They're very much into self development. They understand that it's going to be <clears throat> a very long journey and they understand that they need to invest their time to become somebody they are not, which is the CEO that is going to manage 10 people, 100 people, 500 people, 1,000 people. These are not the same set of skills, right? So you need to understand, you, uh, ego, of course, everybody has ego, right? But a misplaced ego can, can and will get in the way of that kind of growth, right? because it, there's gonna be a misalignment between who you are and what you can be and what you wanna do. So of course, they have strong pe people skills because it goes together. They're investing, even if they don't necessarily have those, those people skills uh, from the get-go. Uh, and if they understand, they can't even develop because some of them are actually handicapped in a way, so that they, they can't develop sufficient uh, uh, people skills, they're gonna, have the kind of people around them that are triple A world-class performers in, um, in, in, in people management. And of course, they have deep passion. Well, I mean, that's, that, that should be very clear. But what it means, and it goes together with, with the, the, the next uh, four and five, is they're able to articulate very clearly what's gonna happen in their market in the next five to 10 years they have the very clear vision what's gonna happen and they're able to communicate it very clearly to their team so that there is a very clear North Pole, North Star, sorry, uh, for the team that gives direction and gives inspiration to where the company uh, is going to go. Uh, so I'm gonna share now a, a, a few uh, investments that we have made, uh, that we have in our portfolio, and the, that these are unicorn companies. So the first one is Glovo, uh, which has a valuation of uh, more than two, million, two billion euros. Uh, the company is six years old, uh, based in Barcelona. And um, it clearly, uh, I mean, Glovo, for those who don't know what, what it does, it's a super app, so it allows you through your phone to order pretty much uh, you know, anything from groceries, food, um, pharmacy, drugs. You, know, um, you can even in, in various regions of the world uh, order cash to be delivered to your door, uh, your keys, uh, you know, pretty much anything. So they, they are uh, actually uh, a competitor of Amazon in big cities because they empower local SMEs to have a shop through that super app and to deliver to your door within 15 to 20 minutes, uh, uh, pretty much anything that they put on these, uh, this marketplace uh, for, for sale. Um, from the get-go, they, um, they, uh, they had very high ambitions. They wanted to be one of the leaders in the market. Um, they have a very ambitious roadmap, but they they almost failed, they almost went bankrupt. This is also one of the common traits of many unicorns is at one point, you know, something goes wrong. Um, but they were able to, uh, to, to pass the Rubicon and, uh, uh, you know, this uh, valley of the death and, uh, and become successful. They've developed over the years a very successful uh, playbook, which is a roadmap, so how you enter into a market Right? and what you have to do uh, in each of these markets where you enter so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. So there's, it becomes extremely scalable. You put 
you, you hire teams, basically new teams for a new city or a new country, and you train them in a country where the playbook is being deployed, and then when they're trained, you send them to the new city and, and you replicate. And so today, the company is 20, 23 countries, 950 cities, and has uh, more than 100,000 uh, SMEs on, on its app. Um, one of the things that's relevant here uh, is um, uh, this uh, little chart um, that, uh, that As Oscar uh, shared with us, uh, which is how he sees um, is uh, the way he thinks about delegation, right? And I think it's very interest, very insightful, very relevant to how you think about uh, allocating your time, right? So what he's, what he's been doing since very early in the company is delegating to other people. So, so that's how you scale, right? Otherwise, you, you can't scale. Um, and um, if you look at the chart, so for all things where is, is good in terms of competence and that he loves, well, he's going to delegate. And you think, okay, well, that's, I don't understand that. Well, actually, it makes sense because he's so good at it and he loves it. So he's actually able to identify the people that are going to have the right traits and skills and personality uh, attributes that are going to work for that role, right? Uh, more or less the same thing for the, uh, the areas where he's uh, good uh, in terms of competence, but that he hates doing. Of, co of course, that, this one makes more sense. Uh, and then for the others, well, uh, what he's going to do for those the things that he's not competent in, but that he loves to do, well, he's going to invest his time to learn, right? And for the other, the other things, uh, low competence and uh, low passion, well, he's going to just uh, outsource that to other people. And um, am I out of time? No, I can continue. Thank you. All right. So um, uh, the next one, uh, a very nice company. Also, uh, you, you may have seen they just went um, uh, floated on the New York Stock Exchange um, three, three, four weeks ago. Uh, valuation one point six billion dollars. Uh, what uh, and and the founder and and CEO, by the way, is uh, lives and. Uh, and operates here from Luxembourg. Uh, Peter has been here, I think, uh, speaking over the years uh, in the conference. Um, th what Spire is doing is creating, it's a big data company using data from space, right? So, but in order to get that data, uh, they had one issue is they, because they didn't have the data, uh, they had to launch satellites. You know, it's, you know, it's a small problem. Uh, so they went out to build their own satellites, yeah. eventually even vertically integrating the whole, you know, uh, satellite manufacturing chain, can you imagine? Uh, so that, that sort of tells you the ambition and the sheer passion of these people um, to, to really have a profound impact on Earth, right? And how did you, what, why and how do you do that? Well, when you think really big, Right? You think, well, the space industry, actually, this is something that is not going to have a, um, a perspective on a very local place on the planet. It's from the get-go, you think low uh, Earth uh, orbiting satellites, you're going to uh, uh, launch uh, more than 100 of them. You're going to have global coverage 24-7. Right? So this is going to provide insights that nobody else was able to provide before. And, um, and they've done that to, to do uh, several things, but one of them was to create the world's most advanced weather forecasting model, which they have achieved, right? They, ha they are today several days ahead of the, uh, the benchmark, uh, the gold standard, which is the ECMWF, so the European, uh, European uh, mid-range weather forecast. Um, and, uh, and through that, of course, they're able to provide data uh, that can do many things, which is save lives, but also save assets from destruction. Um, and they're tracking uh, planes and uh, ships as well, uh, real time. The, um, the, the, the 
clear traits of this, the, this team was extremely talented and driven people again. Uh, and they had identified uh, the kind of technology that was unique and where they had basically no competition. So remember this Venn diagram where uh, you think nobody's interested in this, you think there's a, a future, big future market, and you have an edge? Well, they had an edge, they all attended uh, ISU, uh, International Space University. They, um, they were extremely bright. Peter is a physicist, um, worked at CERN and things like that. So really smart and driven people that want to have an impact. Uh, the last one is Crew, uh, Swedish uh, telemedicine platform. Again, unicorn, uh, extremely successful, extremely large market opportunity. You understand that with COVID, of course, but even beyond COVID, uh, people have issues of, you know, being treated because they, it's not easy to have access to uh, medical treatment because there are physical bottlenecks, of course, because of the limited number of doctors in many disciplines. I think in, in the US, for instance, there are 5,000 dermatologists for 300 million people. Can you imagine? Uh, it's a true number. Uh, and there's many examples like that, right? In, in mental therapy in Europe, there's just the shortage in terms of, you know, the ability to get uh, treatment for mental uh, health is just, it's, it's mind-boggling, right? Uh, I'm sorry for the unintended pun. So, uh, and again, for Crew, it's, it was about uh, execution excellence, just in, as in the way of, uh, of Glovo or Inspire. It's this ability to define a playbook and then industrialize to scale. For Spire, I didn't say that, but so they, they had the first satellite, it took to then two years. Today, a satellite takes them three weeks to build from scratch, right? Three weeks, right? So it's, it's about finding a recipe that you can repeat at scale, right? So the key ingredients to build a unicorn, you see four things. There are five. One is ambition to become the category leader in your field. In Europe or worldwide, better to have, you know, moonshot type uh, approach. Market, large opportunity. What does large opportunity mean? It doesn't mean two, three billion euros. That's too small. A large opportunity is much, much bigger than that. It's in the dozens or the hundreds of billions of euros in a market per year. The team, of course, extremely smart. The grit, because it's tough, because you're gonna face near-death experience, and, well, you need to hire a lot of people very fast, and you need to understand, you know, what, what it takes, which typically you don't know before you start. So, and access to the money, it may sound like a, uh, you know, a circle or, type of, um, of reasoning, but it's not, actually. Some people do have access, and what it means is when you create the circumstances, when you create the look of success of a unicorn, people realize it very fast, right? Uh, you look around, why is there 300 unicorns created this year? It's because people have found, you know, what, in a way, what the recipe is to make it, right? Of course, some of them are gonna fail, but that's not the, the issue. Access to the money, creating that, uh, uh, that uh, visibility, uh, if you will. And of course, the last one, which is not on the slide. Anybody who, kn who knows what, what is one of the biggest ingredients of cr unicorn creation? Anyone there? Yes. A bright idea? No. Who said that? Absolutely. Luck. Luck. There's luck and skill, right? Luck is absolutely critical, right? Uh, because there's so many unknowns, and we're going to talk about that uh, with class just uh, now in a minute. There's so many unknowns. There's so many risks that you need to have luck, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, every, every day or every two days, you need to have some luck, right? And... Uh, that's, that's about it. So don't brainstorm ideas, but solve a problem. Uh, establish a mission-driven uh, culture. Know when it's time to pivot. 
and uh, when it comes to expansion, understand the problems which are facing new markets. I think that these are very simple, mundane things that are written here on the screen, but uh, most, most founders, unfortunately, fail to really deeply understand that into their bones, uh, and that's why they, they, they don't necessarily make it. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome, uh, for this enriching presentation. I think it was a complex term made very simple. And uh, you can stay with us on stage here while we are going to start the fireside chat on deep tech startup journey, combining investors' expectations with today's greatest challenges. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome here Dr. Klaus Heiss here who's the executive director from NRW Bank. He's responsible for over 15 investments in European venture capital funds and manages fund-to-fund -fund activities sponsoring 30 regionally focused seed capital funds. Gentlemen, I'll let you go on then. Yeah, hello everybody, both here in the room and uh, also online. I'm very happy and delighted that I can actually be here in, in person again. And uh, I've been, I think, at ICT Spring uh, for the past few years and uh, always like it because it gives me um, a bit of an, an, a new perspective or an external perspective on our business as well. Thank you, Klaus. Well, nice to meet you. And uh, likewise, I, I'm uh, always very happy to, to be here and uh, to engage with, um, with uh, the public and, and, and very esteemed colleagues uh, about, uh, about fascinating subjects. So I, I understand we're going to talk about uh, deep tech. Is that right? Yeah. But maybe I can um, take a minute to, to uh, frame what we are actually do and how um, we come into financing deep tech or what we finance. So I'm running uh, NRW Venture, which is the, the venture capital unit of NRW Bank. NRW Bank is a development bank for one of the German states, Nordrhein-Westfalen. And actually, it's just one of the lender, one of the states, but uh, it's comparable to the Netherlands, uh, both in economic output and in um, number of people uh, living there. And... Um, we're doing this for 15 years. Even if we are kind of a development bank, we are strong in, in equity, private equity. In the venture side alone, I have about 500 million under management. Um, then we have an SME business, buyout business with about another 500 million. And we are doing both investments directly into startups across all industries, but they have to have one foot in Northern Westfalen in our uh, jurisdiction, basically. And uh, we are also doing investments uh, into venture funds, both uh, regional and European. And the fund where we're investing in uh, right now is uh, a 100 million fund. And again, as I said, across the industries, uh, life science, digital, software, deep tech. Very good. And um, so maybe I, I'll uh, give a few words as well about my firm. So my, my firm invests uh, uh, in, uh, in Luxembourg, but also across Europe, the US, and, uh, and Israel. Uh, and we invest uh, so out of two funds. We have a seed fund uh, that invests more locally because seed is about local uh, investments. And then the growth fund invests um, in, uh, in, in Europe, Israel, and the US then. So, and in that fund, it's a growth fund. So we invest mainly from series B onwards. Uh, and we do a little bit of Series A uh, as well. Um, the, the, the approach is, um, is that of unicorn investing, but unicorn with an impact. So we are a purposeful um, and mission-driven venture fund, uh, which means that um, firms that we invest in need to address one or more of the United uh, Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and, um, and, and because they need to have the profile of a unicorn, that we know that they're going to be able to do that at scale. Because that's for us, that's what matters, is to have this, you know, not a local impact, but a global impact. Uh, out of our seed fund, it's a local impact. So it's diff very different animals. 
Um, and uh, from a sectoral approach, we, we don't actually have, um, you know, we're very sector agnostic. Uh, so we don't only do deep tech. I'm the deep tech guy on the team, uh, but my partners do other things as well. Uh, and I've been investing in deep tech for uh, roughly, uh, yeah, 27 years. <laughs> Something like that. So Klaus, uh, tell, tell me, um, in, in terms of uh, the type of opportunities you look at in terms of deep tech, what, what are the, the things you look at, what, what is relevant to you, what, what, uh, uh, what are the criteria for you know, being, in, in, let's say, on, on the right side of the table where, and you, you're going to think, okay, well, this is interesting. So um, we, we are thinking and acting like uh, any private uh, venture capital investor, even if you're uh, state-owned. But that's uh, what we have developed over the past 15 years, actually acting like a, a normal venture investor. And as such, we are actually thinking about and, and looking at the same things uh, a venture investor would look like, which is team, market, and a real solution that is really needed, what, what you alluded to. And... Um, in the deep tech space, actually, there are some particular challenges, actually, um, where we, we have to get comfortable with. And um, in, in, in deep tech, basically, what makes it sometimes difficult is that uh, kind of the risk uh, we see as a, as a venture investor is not ideally aligned with the need of capital at that stage of risk. And maybe in, in order to give that some context, um, I have actually, I see two areas of deep tech that I don't find particularly challenging in this regard. And one would be digital as in, in software, because in this area, you can typically show a little bit of value, a minimum viable project, a product with uh, only a little investment. So software digital investments are often very much backloaded, where a lot of the capital is actually needed for execution and scaling and not for showing that it actually works. And the other area where we actually are quite comfortable with, where we have done a lot of investment, I would say, is in the life science area, be it medtech, be it drug development. And this is actually interesting because in, in the life science, you have a lot of capital need at, at phases where the risk is very high. But you have actually a very well-established ecosystem over the last decades that has developed a framework how to stage the risk, how to stage the investment. You do, um, I don't know, uh, lab trials, you do um, test your drug in, in, in an animal, then you do first in men, and you have uh, contract research organizations, you have contract uh, manufacturing organizations there, you have a a whole ecosystem of specialized investors, an ecosystem of organizations helping you with regulatory issues and with the actually getting the drug to market. And then the um, big pharma um, companies are actually waiting when a drug is really uh, showing its potential to actually take it from there, maybe do the last of the regulatory thing and then do the, the marketing and, and um, yeah, sales of that. And so, actually, yeah, it's, it, it is a high-risk endeavor, but it has a well, very well-developed and understood framework. And in a lot of other things, um, actually, we have the, the challenge that a lot of the risks are not yet known. We don't know what is needed, uh, actually, to make it work. If I take, uh, for example, uh, something like industrial biotech, um, it works in the lab. You can show that often with uh, little investment, but then the issue is in scaling. You don't know... Um, how much is needed and if it will work uh, to work at the 10,000 ton scale. Or in, in, in uh, space, actually, we are just getting to the, um, to the phase where we actually have a framework. But over the past, uh, I don't know, 10 or 20 years, it has been very, very difficult uh, because there was not enough context. And you didn't actually know what the risk was in, in developing a satellite. Will it work getting it to orbit? Yeah, I, I can share also an, uh, an anecdote about this. We made an investment uh, a few years ago in a, in a company in a very deep tech space, and uh, Intel Capital was the uh, lean investor. And so I, I asked them, "So how did you do your due diligence, you know, on on uh, on this project?" And they said, "Well, uh, we had a lot of discussions with the management team, the founders, 
Um, and we, we thought hard about that, but uh, then we figured, well, we don't know. Nobody's ever done that before, so we don't know if that's possible. But talking with the management, we think it is, uh, maybe. <laughs> You know, so um, and uh, and we ended up investing, and uh, and we're very happy today. Uh, so what 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 it says is it it, it always depends on on uh, on the team, right? So this was um, in a sector where there's probably 50 people around the world that know uh, you know what they're talking about, uh, and this was you know the very top people in that 50. Um, so if there was any chance to make it happen, uh, that was with these guys. Um, and of course, there was a risk. And so coming back to what, you, what Klaas was saying, I think what makes it difficult to invest in, in, um, in, in deep tech is, uh, you know, is, is, is a bit of mathematics con called combinatorial analytics. You know? uh, so you, you, you adding up the probability of, of success or failure uh, one to the other in a software company which, where it's relatively easy and there's not many risks. Even in a, you know, in, in a Glovo, for instance, uh, so very relatively simple business, you, you can very quickly, you end up with 10 different uh, so probability hypotheses. You know, can, can they do this right? There's a 90% chance of that they will. Can they do this second thing right? There's a 90%, and you add them up, 90% 90, 90 chance each time, you take 10 of these questions, so these risks, and you end up with a probability of success of 34% in a simple business. Now you go to deep tech, and it's not 10 questions. You had 20, 30 questions. So the probability of success is actually in the single digits or low single digits. So you see, and this is how, as investors, we approach investing. It's through a risk-based approach, right? And we... We're, I think we're called risk capital in, in, in some languages, uh, European languages, not venture capital in, as in English. But, and it says a lot, right? So what we, what we mean is we need to understand the risks. We take risks, but we don't take any and all risks and un, not all unknown risks. We want to reduce the number of risks that we take so we can, we can uh, find the, the right return risk uh, couple. And, and also for us, we are typical early stage investor. We invest one to three million in the first one where we get in and up to 10 million uh, into a company. So uh, most deep tech approaches, the really new tech, uh, take of course um, 50 million or, or several hundred million actually to, to get to scale and get to, to exitable. And uh, we need to get comfortable that um, beyond our very first consortium of, of early stage investors that with that money, we can get, get enough uh, interest and buzz and, and um, excitement that actually uh, other investors are coming in after us. So we had a, a number of investments actually in, in deep tech space, be it industrial biotech or um, semiconductor photonics laser. And the tech worked, um, but then actually when it came to, to scaling, um, the companies were not able to generate enough excitement and so they're just limping along and, and it couldn't grow and because they couldn't show significant and exciting growth. Um, we didn't get, um, I don't know, the middle stage investors uh, excited enough to, to come in. And once you have uh, momentum and you get, uh, that was alluded to in the, in the earlier segment, um, once you get to, to a stage where you need financing rounds of, of 100 million or more, you typically have enough excitement around the company that um, you get the, the 100 million uh, euro investors uh, into the round. Yes, I think that this, this scaling issue is very different from the, the software and digital world where, I mean, when, when I started my first firm uh, 20 years ago, you know, investors were telling me, but how are you going to scale? Because you know there was no cloud, so you had to have your own dedicated you know infrastructure uh, that you had to build. Um, now these days, of course, it's no longer an issue. Whereas in hardware, deep tech, it still is an issue today, right? And so one of the key things we look at is, okay, are you a 10x plus type you know uh, company in terms of the performance uh, that you're delivering to 
uh, your future customers, right? So it doesn't mean that you're 10%, I mean, 10 times faster, so a thousand times faster, or uh, and that you're 99% uh, more energy efficient, right? So, and you need this kind of gap and leap in order to, uh, let's say, attract investment uh, above and beyond the, the, the capacity to scale, which comes later, uh, because the risks are just so huge that there's no, there's no uh, uh, interest for incremental uh, advances and progresses, which is very different from the digital world where, you know, we do A-B testing, we iterate, and, uh, and there's always these, you know, uh, uh, very, very small uh, progress that you do each and every day. It's like 0.01%, but each and, but, and it builds up, right? And, and this, is, this makes, this, this is very powerful at the same time, but not, not in, uh, in, in, in deep tech. But I think the, the European ecosystem over the last uh, 10, 15 years has developed tremendously. And uh, it's actually now much easier to get consortia together that have high conviction and actually uh, want to finance uh, deep tech companies, um, even if it, it takes a long time to market. You're used to long time to market in the, in the pharma space, um, but now you can get, I have some, some German examples here, ISA Aerospace, Lilium, um, Linaix in the software space, you have some companies that take a long time to market, take a long time to really get to a significant uh, revenue, but you get consortia um, that are willing actually to put up these large financing rounds. And also uh, what has uh, matured a lot, uh, and that's not only in Germany, but in all of Europe, in France, uh, in the UK, in the Nordics, is actually management teams that um, feel confident enough and that you can, uh, I don't know, as investors trust enough actually to scale a company. When I started in the business 25 years ago, often we had uh, just university students with big dreams or three guys from McKinsey uh, thinking they can revolutionize the, the e-commerce world and um, they're going at it uh, quite haphazardly. And now you have repeat entrepreneurs um, being in, a, in a, an executive in a startup is actually a very viable career alternative uh, instead of being an executive at, at Allianz or Daimler or, or Airbus or something like that. Yeah, I agree with you about this renaissance of, of uh, hardware and deep tech. I think, uh, I think we can see it in, in the numbers of um, uh, you know, invested money in, uh, around the world. Uh, I think it's, it's only going to grow up. And of course, new space is one, one, only one part of that, that equation. Uh, but there's many, I think that's, I mean, with um, Moore's law uh, ha having come to an end and, um, and, and CPU uh, performance being sort of capped uh, now or, or, or actually growing very slowly, uh, we see there's, there's much more need to, to go uh, wide uh, because here we were going you know, with just one solution, trying to improve performance in one way with one tool. And there's many ways of, of uh, improving, improving performance across many different things across uh, the world and in the physical world, uh, the software has can can only do so much, right? To act on the physical world, and especially you know in in the context of the climate crisis, uh, I mean the the CO2 doesn't live uh, on the internet, right? Uh, it's in the real world, and we're going to have to have a, an impact on the real world. So there's no way we can only rely on smartphones to solve the issue. Uh, quite the contrary, maybe. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, it's big, big um, potential, I think, uh, for the, the, the next uh, 30 years is going to be most probably a, a very big boom in, in, uh, in, in hardware. Uh, the, the additional thing I think you pointed at in terms of, the, you know, the teams um, having this capacity to, to, to do it, uh, I, I would agree as well. It's what, what I, I've seen over the, the decades is, um, a professionalization of engineering team because you typically have those, you know, uh, PhDs or uh, engineering uh, 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 talent that has invented something. Well, the first thing that, is, that comes always to my mind is, is one is we don't need new tech, right? We need solutions to problems, right? And this is sometimes the bias with which engineers come from, you know, they are, or inventors. They invent things just for the sheer, you know, um, joy of finding out that they can do something. 
Um, and, and actually, no, you need to have a market for something. And it's not only the best solution that wins, it's the best marketed solution that wins, right? Uh, I've seen it uh, <laughs> uh, myself, having invested in, in the firm that, uh, you know, M Systems that um, invented flash memory, uh, and they ended up be being bought out by a firm that was superior in marketing, but not technologically, uh, that called SanDisk. Um, they got bought for 1.6 billion, so that was a very happy uh, exit, uh, a very successful one. But they could have become a $30 billion uh, company, right, had they been more successful from a marketing perspective. And also, um, besides NRV Venture, because we are seeing that in, in Nordrhein Westfalen as well, we have actually um, gathered a, a coaching team in, in um, my division um, that goes into universities and research centers and is coaching uh, scientists and uh, engineers on how to form a business, how to build a successful team, helping them if they show interest at all, then taking them by the hand and helping them through the company foundation stage. And we have a, a co-investment uh, program with business angels as well. So we're trying really to, to help entrepreneurs at every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you, both of you, for this very interesting insight uh, on deep tech startup journeys. I'm really, really excited uh, to start the first pitching session uh, of the Mastermind Summit um, that's coming up now. And uh, we spoke about ecosystems. We spoke about giving startup advices. And now we're coming to the main part uh, of the people, the startup ecosystem. So please... Um, Let's start the, the pitching session. Uh, just two words on the rules. We're going to have uh, each startup pitch for five minutes, followed by a Q&A by our uh, jury, which is composed of uh, Dr. Klaus Heis, Executive Director of uh, NRW Bank, uh, Stefani Silvestri, who's the Senior Advisor Startup Acceleration at Lux Innovation, uh, Jerome Vitama, Tech Investor, Entrepreneur, and Co-Founder of X1 Capital, my very dear colleague, Bastian Berg, CEO of Luxembourg City Incubator, and Frederick Becker, project manager at the Ministry of Economy. So let's start with the first startup that was selected today to pitch in the deep depth category. And we therefore connect with Sumi Chaka, I hope I pronounced the name right, uh, from Quantum Operation, who join us today from Japan. Sumi Chaka, you can go on and you have five minutes. Okay, I'll start. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sumi from Quantum Operation Nick. Um, today, I'll share about my project, Reduce Need on Pain. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just going to interrupt here. We have the wrong presentation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, now I share I'm my sure. screen, but I... Oh, can I see my screen? By Quantum Operation. Okay, I'll start. Hi everyone, I'm Sumi from Quantum Operation Inc. And today I'll share about my project, Reduce Needle and Pain. We are IoT healthcare startup and sensing technology in high medical level in Japan. So do you know there are many small children who suffer diabetes? They cannot produce insulin in their body. So they have to pick their fingers to monitor glucose many times in every day, every week, or their whole life. This is surely painful. So not only children, but also one in 11 adults has diabetes in the world, and total number is very huge and will increase up to 700 million in the near future. And about 10% healthcare costs in the world are exclusively spent on diabetes. There are huge number and money. So our solution needs, we are developing continuous non emails to wearable glucometer. The important point, our glucometer is suitable for continuous monitoring. Our watch type sensor is better for patients because it can be easily installed into the lifestyle and can achieve 24 hours, seven days continuous glucose monitoring. You may doubt why we can. Our solution has a strength in two points. One is for sensing and monitoring technology. We have many expertise in optical design, 
sensor correction mechanism and noise reduction. So our devices have specification as power saving and downsize. It is essential element for compact size wearable vital sensors. The second point is we have an open API policy. Usually, major wearable company wants to build closed ecosystem and control data by themselves. But we are a small startup company and want to collaborate in open API policy with our partners. This is our approach. We can capture blood glucose change before and after eating and compare its accuracy with SMB's existing medical device. It is fast continuous non-invest glucometer in public, which is able to fall distance successfully in number. We are not aiming to sell our device directly to patients or consumers. Our customer is hospitals, nursing homes, care facilities, insurance, and business companies, and users are patients and workers. B2B2C model, we will sell not only hardware, but also software together and sell as subscription. We funded about 10 million US dollars last time. As a strong partner, we have two Japanese business corporations as a capital alliance partner. One is for Taisho Pharmaceutical, leading pharmaceutical company in Japan, and the other one is for Alfresa, one of Japanese largest medical wholesalers. Thanks to many medias, we have more than 100 media tracks in CS 2021 and after, measures are Nikkei's, Financial Times, or Forbes, or etc. And we got many hours. These are the captured articles which we are mentioned by such medias. Next, uh, our team members are 22, and we have variety in backgrounds. I will introduce of some. Our lead engineer Yamagishi has expertise in noise reduction and appropriate get appropriate signals. Our hard engineer Komata has expertise in circuit design to reduce power consumption. And our software engineer Ryu has great experience in healthcare application. Our CEO Kazuma Kato and I, as a management team, have many experience in operating startup companies. You may think where we can get the device. We will introduce the first POC and evaluate the result from the next year, 2022, and we have a plan to release our healthcare device product as a around summer 2022. And after that, we'll go into the medical certification process. We estimate we will get finally FDA and C approval by 2024, then we'll launch medical devices. Our ask is meeting with investors and partners. We now start to raise our new funding round in this year, 2021. We will use raised money to expand mass production and invest the huge, to the future development. I'm sorry, and Sumitaka, we, I have to stop yeah. you. We're out of time. Yeah. Really sorry. Yeah, yeah no problem. Yeah, it takes some time to start. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much yeah. for your pitch. And we're going to the, the jury with any questions. Yes, class. Sorry, I'm just going to bring a microphone. Hi. Thanks. So uh, the question would be, if you from, from your side actively are working with um, providers of insulin pumps to integrate your device with them to provide a closed loop. Oh, thank you for your question. Yes, we have many, uh, some ask from the, some companies like the insulin pump, et cetera. Yeah, we can integrate it into our devices with the insulin pump, we think, as a medical device. Can you talk about the competition and, uh, you know, the, those that mm -hmm. make patches that link up to your phones and uh, also mm -hmm. provide information? Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. Yes, uh, it's, uh, the competition like the patches we call the CZM devices, it needs a still a tiny needle and it can make the, some medical consumer uh, consumptions. Uh, so the, but the, our devices do not have any needle and we can only use the electricity to detect the uh, glucose. It, it is a very different from the, such a CZM device. Another question, maybe. Currently, you're in which market operating? Uh, you mean the, for our current uh, market, you mean? Yes. Currently, you're in the Japanese market? 
And ah, you're okay. planning but to. We are still, uh, yes, we are still in the prototype, but we're firstly aiming for the Japanese market, but not only for the Japanese, but all for the other overseas market, like the Middle East or uh, some US or, and a uh, very big market for the diabetes, we think. Thank you. Um, regarding again competition, when when do you mm -hmm. expect competitors like like the Apple Watch, like uh, all the, mm -hmm. the those that are in wearables and that have mm -hmm. uh, uh, tens or hundreds of millions of of, of users to mm -hmm. uh, to themselves offer an, uh, a glucose monitoring uh, mm -hmm. a sensor within their their device, and and how do you see them as a competition? Okay, thank you for your question. Yes, we uh, think that it's a very, a very good, great competitor like the Apple or just some big uh, consumers. But uh, we have the technology uh, like, uh, yes, we have the two. The one is for the open air policy. This is uh, only we can provide the raw data as a glucose. We think the one is a competition. And second one is that these uh, major competitors uh, aiming for the healthcare market only. They do not have the intention to the medical market. I'm sorry, I would have to uh, move on to the next pitch here. The timing team at the back is really putting pressure on me. So please excuse me for this. Oh, no problem. Thank you so thank much. You so much yeah, thank you so much, Mitaka. Great time. Yeah, thank you. We're moving to our next pitch here, Luigi Lenguito from Before AI. It's your turn now. Five minutes. You're seeing my screen. Yes. This is uh, Luigi Lenguito, and I will present you today the first predictive cybersecurity uh, solution in market before AI. So first, let me show you what we are doing for some of our customers. We are able to help them prevent ransomware attacks and data exfiltration, thanks to our predictions. We help them protect their remote workers and avoid the impact of large scale attacks that uh, target them uh, thanks to our intelligence product. And we help them protect their brand and their customers from scams and phishing by predicting in, uh, in anticipation, uh, you know, these this mal malicious activities from, from criminals uh, out there. Pre-crime is not safe function anymore. It's our product. It's a result of seven years of research, multiple international patents. We are a French company, fully distributed, very diverse, more than 10 nationalities in the team. We were founded last year after a couple of years in stealth mode. We have partners already across the globe, excited by our technology. And again, we are the first and only patented predictive cybersecurity. As you can see, we have been already uh, you know, many have recognized it. Many others join us uh, to 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 fight the the cyber threats, and we are partnered with great companies like Global Cyber Alliance and and Virus Total that help us spread some of our uh, findings. So, what we do uh, specifically, we are able to predict domain names that will be used for malicious activity. We do these at a large scale, more than 300,000 prediction daily in a very reliable way. Only 0.5% of our prediction turn out to be uh, false. And we do it with a method that is threat agnostic. That means we can predict future threats that have never manifested before. This is very different from any other solution in market. They need to see the attack, to detect it, analyze it, and then respond. In our case, we observe like a criminal investigator would do on a serial crime, uh, you know what are the the moves and the the, the, the activities of the uh, of the criminals and predict their next victim and the next uh, threat vector that they will use. We provide what is called a cyber threat intelligence, so it's a feed of information that is digested by existing security solution in customer security architecture, and so we upgrade the security posture from one of detection and response to one of proactivity and foresight. Let me give you an example. This domain name was registered in the night of the 12, 12, uh, 22 of June. Uh, we immediately identified it as a future malicious added to our pre-crime reporting. That is the threat intelligence that feed into our customer. At that stage, our customer were already blocking traffic to this domain and were protected. It took another four days 
for the domain to be active. Uh, that means that for the previous three days, the domain was silent, nobody would see it. But four days later, as I said, it became active and started distributing malware. And if we look at it two months later on VirusTotal, this is one of the most renowned uh, list of cyber threat intelligence, we are still the only one, and I checked again this morning, we're still the only one knowing about it. So our customers are protected. Unfortunately, many others are under attack. What is behind this domain is a lockbit ransomware distribution uh, server. So obviously quite a dangerous uh, you know, uh, source of threat. Why all of this is important, I think every day you hear news about ransomware attacks, phishing, business email compromise, and so on. So I'm not going to uh, belate it, the point. But I think what's less known is that attackers are in network for an average of 280 days. That means they have a huge amount of time to steal data, to compromise information, to uh, you know, find other sources to then ransom or, uh, or you know, steal money from, from those organizations. And they do this in 80% of the cases using domains. So our technology cover you know, most of the cases and is predictive and preventive. That means that we block them before they enter in the market. Our vision is indeed to provide uh, a new solution that brings cybersecurity uh, a new capability of, of uh, prevention. And Ta as uh, you saw earlier, Thank prevention is, is the best cure. Thank you, Luigi. I'm sorry, we have no more you time. Are. We have to pass on to the, the questions. Uh, jury. Mm -hmm. Any questions, Fred Frederick? Question um, regarding the, the solution. So you're using it basically for mostly for cybersecurity, but, but why are you not using it as well for counterfeit and for stolen goods? So for instance, uh, now uh, someone would, would uh, open an, a domain name like, I don't know, Louis Vuitton, uh, less expensive mm -hmm. or something like that. So you could then already inform them that, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, well, if that were your customer, uh, obviously, that, uh, that that there is a malicious activity, which is not a cyber threat, but which is then an, uh, an, uh, well, uh, someone that uh, tries to st uh, sell either stolen or counterfeit uh, goods. Is that none, sure. none of the applications that you are envisioning? So, so two things and to answer that question, very uh, good one. So first of all, uh, me and my co-founders, we come from an IT infrastructure perspective. So for commercial reason, and to uh, you know, hit the traction and fund the company, we decided to start from the cybersecurity because we saw the market opportunity. And as you've seen, customers are responding to that. To your point, the technology is through pre-crime. The patents enable us to apply it to any digital imprint. So we can do it for blockchain transactions. We can do it for websites. We can do it for even physical goods that are tagged with RFIDs and things like that. Those are all future developments of the platform that will come in a later stage. For now, we are still in survival mode as any startup that is less than a year old. And then we are focusing on cybersecurity because we see the market opportunity to, uh, to establish ourselves. We have time for just one question from the jury. So who wants to go next? Jerome. Yeah, can you, um, hi Luigi, can you tell us about the business model and whether you have traction? Absolutely. So we have uh, it's a subscription model. So it's a monthly billing with an average price between 10 and 20,000 euro every month. Uh, so the customer receives this information feed that can be used in any uh, technical solution that they have to protect their network. So this fixed you know, flat fee for any scale of a company. And uh, in terms of traction, we have uh, now about 10 customers and 40 uh, different proof of concepts uh, in market. So we are, we are growing quite fast. And uh, you know, hopefully by the end of the year, we should be above 100K of monthly uh, revenue building. Thank you very much, Luigi. That was very interesting. We're moving on to our next startup, Spectral Transactive Memory Systems. Please welcome Sarah Botolazzo. Are you here with us, Sarah? I'm Sarah Botolazzo, the CFO of Spectral. And at Spectral, we want to help solving the loss of know-how for industrial companies. The loss of know-how for industrial companies happens for three main reasons. The fact that a lot of industrial outsource their maintenance, but also the issue with the experts, 
because either they, they are retiring or a few cannot, or there's only a few experts and they cannot be everywhere. And the last, the last reason is because know-how in industrial company is not centralized. So it represents a huge risk for industrial companies because they will lose strategic resources that will cost a lot, a lot in terms of injuries, a lot in terms of money, of course. And it is so expensive for an industry to lose this strategic, this know-how that $31 billion per year are spent by Fortune 500 to get back that know-how. And for example, in 2020, 86% of, of manufacturers have launched industry 4.0 projects and 66% have seen benefits from their projects. So how do we do it? How do we help industrial companies? Well, Spectral is a SaaS solution that helps and guides technicians through their industrial operations thanks to augmented reality. So concretely, Spectral guides step-by-step -step technicians through every operation. So it can be maintenance operation, quality check, production operation, or training. Our solution is based on two te technological components, a SaaS web platform that is accessible from every browser, and it, it allows you to create operating procedures, including augmented reality elements in just a few clicks. So in fact, you edit uh, your procedure online, and then Spectral on its own transform, transform these procedures into hologram that can be seen in the AR application available on the Microsoft App Store for the HoloLens, which is the second technological component. And it's allow user to interact with the operating modes within the real environment. Equipped with AR glasses, the operator is now guided step by step to know which task, which task to perform, how to do it, where to do it. And the know-how is, know is capitalized and used daily in every industry. So Spectral offers to industrial a really simple and intuitive augmented reality solution that can be de deployed very quickly by anyone. Our SaaS can be used for any process. So as I say, like in production, maintenance, and training, whose, uh, whose um, execution may directly or indirectly lead to machine downtime, non-compliance, or non-safety. So for the moment, Spectral is, is deployed with global groups in French industry, like in aeronautics, pharmaceuticals, consumer goods, but also transport. And so for the so we've seen some results with our clients. And for example, for the use cases of production, we've, the, we've seen that thanks to Spectral, the error made by the technician has reduced by 98%. And for example, in maintenance, the intervention time and downtime time is reduced by 16%. So Spectral really helps industrial to reduce machine downtime reduce non-conformity and improve overall quality. And this is due to capitalization of know-how, less error and less operating time. And to revolutionize customer, customer experience, we invest on three main R&D topics, which are spatial understanding. That means that the goal is to understand the technician environment during this operation task. Data management, that means that we try to understand this time the technician's behavior and operational best practice to automatically generate industrial processes. We call that human learning. And uh, so yeah, to generate industrial processes in augmented reality to increase customer gains and improve operational excellency. And the last one is what we call knowledge as a service. And it means that the best knowledge and know-how is accessible and available everywhere by everyone that you have an expert guiding you real time, whatever you're doing, hands free. And this is really important to centralize and to create a know-how database. So thank you everyone for your attention. That was perfect timing, Sarah. Any <laughs> questions from the jury? Maybe I'll start uh, quickly. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, your uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the competition? So, because yeah. there's lots of companies doing what you do, or maybe not. <laughs> there are some companies, yes, 
most of them are from the USA and from Canada. There's a few in Europe. And what makes us like different from our competitors is the fact that we are really play, play and, oh, sorry, play and plug, which means that when we arrive at our client site, we don't we don't need a lot of um, yeah, we don't need to, um, how I can say it, like it's really plain, plain, it's really intuitive, it's really easy. We can like, you can start your own operator mods in less than 20 minutes and there's really like no competitive that can do that. So we are really plain and plug. We are also, um, we are really investing in technology. So for example, with the special understanding and what I was talking about during my pitch, uh, we are really as well, um, uh, yeah, so we are really easy to use. And um, what can I say either more? One, it's like, sorry? One more time for one more, one more question. Okay. We're running out of time. Okay. One so, more question. Okay. We have just connectivity. That's all of our solution to be more scalable. And as well, uh, we are experts on augmented reality. It's because we've been we've done that for three years now. We really know the market, we really know the industrial companies and the needs. I think we had a quick question from Klaus. Okay. You, yeah, so what, what's your pricing? Pricing model? Yeah. Um, so how, our how do you pricing, say? Okay. Ten so seconds. Our, ten seconds. Okay. It's a subscription. It's one year subscription. It's a license. And it's eleven thousand k per year, eleven sorry eleven thousand euro per per year. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. Gives me great great pleasure to welcome our next applicant, who's here with us physically. So, it's the company Rejustify, and my great pleasure to welcome Vortec uh, on stage. You have five minutes. Hello and welcome. Um, let me tell you a story about my biggest struggle. My name is Wojciech. That's not the problem. Uh, I quit my PhD to work for to digitalize banks and funds. Still okay. But the biggest struggle was always to put the right data in the right place. And this is a typical um, table or typical data set that has to be filled in and populated by data. And it's not just me doing this problem, but it's also many financial analysts, risk analysts, strategy consultants, and data scientists working for uh, investment managers, banks, insurance companies, and multinationals. Um, so how to fill in the data? Today, there is plenty of uh, sources for data. It can be a file on your PC, it can be a, a some file on company servers, but it can be any kind of statistical office, uh, wearable sensors or satellite images. Uh, but typically, uh, there's plenty of them. They have complex structures of data, and the task of uh, an analyst is to pick the right portions of data, uh, reshape them, format them, to compile a beautiful data set. And today, this task is done manually. And manual data preparations are a painful process, taking up to 80% of analysts' time and wage. They are prone to manual errors, and they are mentally exhausting even before the, the analysis gets started. And today, uh, 10,000 billion in wages are wasted every year, in data preparations, resulting in x times more worth of missed business opportunities, and pi is the size of our team. So let me recap the situation of today. There are wages wasted, mostly by investment managers ma managing our money, savings, pensions, and investments. There are business opportunities missed, and nobody gets the pie. So who has the power to fix this? Let me introduce an all-star team. Um, Dr. Wolski, the guy in the middle, he's an absolute rock star. He's 
a brilliant uh, and brave economist and a programmer at the same time. Uh, he's currently an advisor to the European Investment Bank's uh, Vice President for Innovations and is also our, uh, the developer of our core codes in-house. And we have Mr. Barbera, who is highly skilled in mapping and structuring data for uh, multiple international and policy financing organizations. And myself, I have been digitalizing various uh, a range of products for uh, EIB, EIF, and uh, BNP. And together, we created Rejustify, turning people into data heroes. Typically, you throw an empty table to Rejustify to receive a field in data from primary sources. Uh, and it works in real time. It's a technology to find, access, and merge data from multiple publicly available sources in real time. And you receive a table like this. It's highly accurate, it's incredibly fast, and it's easy to use. It has uh, many features, but the main one is about automatic format, data format recognition, covering worldwide sources of data, uh, covering more than 600 million source tables, and it's learning data preferences of users. Um, all this consists of structuring data, data catalog, and data access. So as an example, we structure better an isolated uh, spreadsheet on Bruegel's, the world's top economics think tank. Uh, think tank. Uh, data structured by Rejustify appears on DBnomics data catalog, and during the lockdown, we provided uh, data access to students at Charles University because the university data terminals were locked down. Um, there are two types of uh, competitors. One of them are traditional data providers with newspaper-like uh, browsing style, but they have nice data. And there are data aggregators. They are more flexible, but always require a human touch. We are finalists at Cloud Tech Innovator of the Year. Uh, and with a thank SaaS you premium. very much. Sorry to cut you off, but we are out of time. Thank you. Questions from the jury? Oh, thank, thank you for, for the presentation. Uh, if, if it's okay, uh, I would start. Um, pricing model. I think you just uh, started with that uh, basic product is free, but uh, how do you price in your your premium offers? Okay, many thanks for the question. Uh, I believe that our service provides much more, let's say, savings in people's time and wage. So if you look at the bottom line, this should give you some clues. Well, of course, we are flexible and we would like to invite, uh, let's say, investment managers, asset managers uh, for a larger client uh, uh, support, on, especially on the beginning. This is our task now. Another question. So what is your current traction? Where do you currently stand and what's the plan to go forward? Okay. So we have like a proof of concept uh, things with uh, several students from Charles University and Luxembourg School of Finance uh, for the data access, building them automated data sets uh, preparation. So this is where we stand. But there is like a whole uh, chain. It's about structuring data and uh, making data appear in a data catalog. And of course, it's the data access, and we believe that it's mostly banks and investment managers that can put the most value in it. One more quick question. Mike, Mike, please. Hello. Yes. Did you have already first clients or first testing clients? Do we have testing clients? Yeah. Well, we started actually. Feedback for. Uh, if we have clients and a feedback from them. Uh, we started with individual researchers in economics, but we decided to move on faster to larger clients. And uh, one of the feedback from the Charles University was that it's 
An AI-enhanced ETL tool is impressively efficient. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wojtek. Big round of applause. We are now moving from data to security and also gives me pleasure to have our next participant here with us today, Daniel Hoon from Mitchell Security. We have five minutes. Okay. Hello everyone, I am Daniel Wynn, CEO of Mitchell Security, and I will present to you how deep tech can make AI more privacy friendly. As you know, AI is a very exciting and innovative technology and has already proven its value, for instance, in healthcare, with FDA approval of AI to save lives. But as you know, you need to share sensible data to AI to actually make it uh, produce res relevant uh, results. And you often need to share this data, and it's a problem due to privacy and security risk. But in addition to this risk, there's also the regulatory part. Because as you know, there is a growing uh, regulatory environment with GDPR, CCPA, and even an upcoming regulation in AI. And because of all these problems, it's very difficult for AI providers to actually be able to deploy and sell their solutions because it's hard to meet this technical challenge in security, privacy, and regulatory things. And that's why we uh, developed Mitri Security. We have developed what we call a zero trust middleware for AI inference. We use uh, confidential computing to make it happen, and we apply cybersecurity to help users benefit from AI without disclosing their data. But what does it mean actually? Imagine you have a hospital, and you want to leverage an AI diagnosis tool. Today, what happens is that you need to share your data to the AI provider, and he will have access to everything, which poses security, privacy, and regulatory constraints. And often, because of this, you're not able to use it. But with Mitri Security, we enable users to benefit from AI thanks to end-to-end -end encryption, and they will be able to benefit from the exact same service, the same quality of predictions, but this time, they never show the data in clear thanks to the encryption process. And this way, we are able to answer the needs of privacy and security of our solution, help users benefit from AI without never exposing their data in clear, and our clients, the AI providers, are able to unlock clients they wouldn't be uh, able to access without the privacy guarantees we provide. And so our vision is really to make a new standard for AI deployment in practice and help users, be it citizens or organisms, to benefit from AI without ever having to worry about privacy and security. But we know it's a complicated uh, project. It uh, combines cybersecurity, AI skills, and software engineering, and we believe it's a kind of soft hardware project, a uh, hard deep tech project, and it will take us 18 months to have something that's actually uh, putable on the market, and that's why we have, st we have focused to start iterate with identified actors in cybersecurity who want to incorporate AI in their products. And uh, we're already working with one of them, with a POC, uh, which is a French cybersecurity act actor called uh, SEAL. But we also focus on biometric authentication, which is a fertile ground for this kind of technology. In parallel, we're working on patenting our solution, uh, collaborating with laboratories for R&D, and finally, uh, certify our product for the security part. And once all this is done, we intend to have a larger distribution channel through cloud marketplaces to deploy our solution and access AI engineers who will be able to deploy our solution in a few clicks. Regarding competition, it's uh, other startups are starting to emerge and work on this aspect of privacy preserving AI. And through our interviews with AI engineers, we've understood that it's not only a matter of security, because other solutions also provide this, but usability. AI engineers don't like to do security, and we're very focused on something that is easily incorporatable into their current workflow and can be deployed in one click, whether on their premises or in the cloud. But also security is paramount for them. Other solutions are very secure, but extremely slow, and our clients told us we wouldn't accept your solution if it's too slow. And if I give you an example, to run an image analysis securely for solution, it can take 0.1 second, but with other competing solution, it takes 40 seconds, which is 400 times slower, 
And it's very important for our clients to have this level of speed. And that's why we believe that today we have the most uh, relevant solution for secure AI deployment. And finally, regarding the team, uh, we have a complementary team. I come from a business and engineering background and work as a data scientist at Microsoft. I have my friend, uh, Rafael, who comes to the business school and uh, worked in data consulting. And Mehdi, our CTO, uh, has been a software engineer for 10 years. We also have a pool of experts to help us on the AI, deep tech, and health aspects. And we believe we have the dream team to actually make uh, AI more privacy friendly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mitchell. Okay, moving to questions. Any questions? Oh, you need a mic. Thank you. So, uh, for my understanding of the technology, um, if I have an, an AI system and I would like to, to deploy your security, does the AI have to be retrained because it's now operating on, on something else, not on uh, the original data? Uh, we, we focus on AI deployment, not training. Uh, and uh, once a model has been trained, you deploy it on a platform and you, uh, your users can use the model securely. But we do not focus on training uh, because it's very technical, uh, it's technically very difficult. But so in terms of business, it's very hard to have some kind of value proposition because if you're able to work with several people and train something concurrently, how much does the, the, how much value does your data bring? I mean, how do you price the fact that you worked on uh, different kinds of data sets? But in our case, it's much easier to monetize what we bring because we unlock values for the deployment of models. Does the user have to retrain? No, we, uh, we uh, only do inference, but we can do continuous training. So uh, it's an energy project different. to do continuous training while deploying the model uh, in our setting. Stephanie? Could you tell us a bit more about the, the, the market potential? Yeah, uh, currently there are two uh, people who are interested in the solution, two kind of actors. Cybersecurity experts want to incorporate AI, and AI solutions want to incorporate more security. And currently, our current risk case are around biometric authentication, which is a huge market that uses AI and provides some security. The healthcare, obviously, uh, who can benefit from this. And we also uh, see a lot of companies that provide AI as a service solutions, but have struggled to uh, convey their clients due to security and privacy impacts of providing AI as a service. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we are out of questions, so we're moving on to the next pitch. A big round of applause for Daniel. Now we're traveling to the USA uh, for a pitch from Armin. Armin, are you here? How are you? It's early in the morning there. We can't hear you, Armin. You cannot hear me? Yeah, now. It's good. Okay. You have five okay, minutes. Hello. Yes. Hello, everyone. It's quite an experience to present at 5 a.m. in the morning. Uh, okay. Let me share my screen. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Armin Roth from Encapsulate. There are three words that no one wants to ever hear, that you have cancer. But recent statistics are showing the fact that more than 40% of the current population of the world will hear this sentence at some point in their lives. That means one person for every household. But what if I tell you that we, we have more than 25 different approved drugs on average for each type of cancer? If that's the case, what makes it so difficult to cure, to cure the cancer and save people's lives? Currently, when a patient is diagnosed with cancer, the oncologist simply assigns one major form of treatment, simply depending on the type of the cancer. However, if the first drug doesn't work, the oncologist assigns additional rounds of treatments each time with a new drug. These additional rounds will keep going until they get some response from the patient's body or the patient passes away. During these rounds of ineffective treatments, the tumor is metastasizing, the tumor is progressing, the patient is under a lot of unnecessary pain. The cost of treatment is more than $100,000, and it takes more than a year on average 
and it progressively lowers the chance of treatment. And in more than a quarter of the cases, the side effects of the chemotherapy itself kills the patient. We at Encapsulate believe that there should be an alternative solution for this challenge. We have developed a new device in which we can grow patients' own cancer cells, but outside of the body. And using our biochip device, we can, kill, we can take just a portion of the initial biopsy and then grow patients' cancer cells outside of the body in our biochips. After our pilot clinical studies that we have done in the last year, we are confident to say that in only one day, we can have hundreds of miniature microcopies of the actual tumor to what patient, very similar to what patient has in his or her body. And then we can apply all the possible treatments to advocate the best course of treatment on an individualized basis. To make it more adaptive for the clinical use, we have also developed a point of care machine to optimize the process. This machine will be installed on site in cancer centers to run the tests with the biochips. Based on the data, we generate a report for the oncologist. So the oncologist ha can have a full insight for analytical insight to make the best decision for the treatment. This is an example of the report that we provide for the oncologist. So instead of this rounds after rounds of, of, uh, of uh, chemotherapy, we can just make one or two cycles of chemo treatment with the most effective treatments. In the past two years, we have done um, a lot of pilot clinical studies, and, and we have proven the fact that our system can work with pretty much any kind of solid tumor. This is the patient samples from lung cancer. And as you can see, we can create tumors, and they not only are in the same shape and size, we can keep track of every single cell inside them. We can track even the size of the tumor and see if we can shrink it, if we can control it, and we can compare an effective treatment just like this one versus a non-effective one. Our process started in uh, you know, having like a two-week process. Now we have reduced that to only seven days. So in only seven days, we can fit easily into the existing paradigm without delaying a patient treatment. We reduced the time and cost for more than $100,000 and also a year, but most importantly, we can save lives. As I mentioned, we, the market for this technology can be any kind of solid tumor, but we are currently focusing on colon and lung cancer because of their prevalence, mortality rate, and complications in choosing the most effective treatment. But why encapsulate technology is unique? Because we are the most accurate and most adaptable one. The reason for that is that we are the only platform that can be completely automated we do not have any limitation in the number of tests that we can do. We are completely tumor mimic. That's the most important in terms of finding the best treatment and most accurate prediction. And also the cost of our production is much less than any other alternative. Most importantly, our technology is the only one which is combining the tumoroid shape with the dynamic flow and mechanical forces and heterogeneity of the natural tumor and full automation. And also we are enabled to do quantitative analysis, which you cannot find in any alternative, even technology. Not, I'm not talking about the one which are already in the clinic, even the ones which are in the process of development. Uh, in the past three years, we have, uh, completed our, uh, we have completed our clinical pilot studies. We started with uh, the MVP. And Thank you very much, with... Armin. I'm sorry, okay, sure. we run out of time. Absolutely. So I will finish this. I would be more than happy to answer any question. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the team and, the, and your expertise? Absolutely. So uh, the co-founders team in, in, uh, includes myself and two other co-founders. We got PhDs in different fields of engineering. I myself graduated from uh, biomedical engineering department. I uh, got my PhD and my MBA from the University of Connecticut. We have a team of oncologists. We have a CMO from, uh, from the oncology department of Harvard, Harvard Hospital and Harvard Healthcare, which is the biggest healthcare system in the Northeast America. And we also have like a team of consultant mentors as well. Could you please go back again on the, on the slide with, your, uh, with where you currently stand and your, Absolutely. your plans forward as you didn't have time to go into that yes. uh, aspect? Yes, I would absolutely. love to hear more about it. Absolutely. So um, for, for the go-to-market plan, we have three independent plans. The first one, which, is, which will be completed after this clinical studies that we're currently running on colon cancer with uh, 150 patients, would be starting as a lab service. 
so we can start through you know gen revenue generation and and we should start locally down the road this doesn't need any fda approval this just need the client clearance in addition to that in two years we are developing as an automation system encapsulizer which will be a class two medical device and that can that can be in partnership in device SaaS model with any lab services like LabCorp, at least, at least in the US, you know, you have Quest Diagnostic LabCorp or Abbott, which you can, you know, send these automation machines all over the country. So they run the experiments and we receive just the results and analyze it and uh, generate the report for the oncologist. So we do not need to receive any physical biopsy from the patients. Thank you. We are unfortunately out of time. We're moving on to our next startup. Thank you very much. Our Thank you very big much round for your time. I enjoyed pitch. it. Thank you. Our last pitcher is actually here with us today of the deep tech category. Welcome, Chandra De Kaiser from United Emotion. Five minutes. Nice to meet you. Hello, Moyan. This is exciting. This is the first time in real life, or is it a Zoom in 3D? I, I don't know. I'm excited. <laughs> you can probably see that. It's been 18 months since I pitched. So yeah, I'm Chandra, co-founder of Moodme. Some of you uh, know me as Moodme, but we have created a new company called United Emotions. It's about to be created in Texas, the great state of Texas. And it's all about the emotion economy. Make sense of emotions to create insights and we do it in a way that is unbiased, unbiased AI and respecting privacy. So we all say that AI is eating the world. It's also humanizing uh, machines, uh, giving empathy to robots and uh, helping doctors understand the patient's experience or uh, students and apps who react to the user's emotions. Emotions analytics is already a big market, $25 billion. The compound annual growth rate is certainly bigger. This is a pre-COVID uh, figure. And so we are on a very big market with many verticals, as you can see. Now, the problem with emotions is that we have a lot of information system with a lot of intellectual capital, but there is no emotional intelligence in our system. I mean, our apps are totally <laughs> unaware of how we feel, uh, robots, but also now that we live in Zoom, except today, <laughs> uh, now that we live in Zoom, we are spending our lives in Zoom, literally. And someone was quoting in Stanford, there is no mood in Zoom. Uh, how about measuring the student's engagement or the, the teamwork? Could you understand if some of your uh, coworkers are going depressed or in burnout by understanding their emotions? So we are into these topics. And more specifically, we are looking at scenarios of healthcare, patient and, uh, experience and well-being. So we already have an AI model. Our product is an AI model, which detects seven emotions. You see the little pentagon. We, we measure each of the seven emotions, happy, surprised, angry, disgust, sad, and so on, uh, on a scale of zero to 100. So it's already a quite subtle understanding of facial expressions, but we are going further with what is called facts, which is detecting 40 micro expressions, which tell more. It's a bit like the lie to me TV show, if you've seen it. So our product is already uh, running. Uh, I'm impressed by the presentation of uh, the guy, uh, you, <laughs> about the securing of AI model. It's a very big topic, very interesting. Uh, our model runs on si inside the end user device. It's edge AI. So it's a lot of uh, optimization so that this AI that the Google, Amazon, and, and, and Microsoft are serving you on their API uh, on the cloud, we do it inside a mobile app or, or uh, inside the browser. So your face no, doesn't leave your device. So that's great for privacy. So we have an MVP and it's a product that has two legs. On the front end, it's capturing the emotions of one or more people in the video call or in any scenario, and it's moving the anonymized data on a back end uh, where you can see a drill down per emotion or per participant per session across multiple sessions. So it's basically uh, visualizing and analyzing the data about emotional journey of people in the different scenarios. Our goal again is really to understand patient experience, to be able to predict uh, the outcome, to understand well-being, and we are uh, in the field of uh, pain measurement. This is a research topic. I will talk to you about it. So our vision is just 
is to create actionable insights with this data. We have a lot of data, seven emotions that we measure multiple times per second. That's a lot of data. We need to create, uh, in French, la substantifique moelle. What is the business outcome of all this data to be able to predict outcomes? In terms of diversity, we're already doing very well. We have data sets built from the ground up, our own data sets, with 10% of any ethnic group or more. So nobody is like a, a big minority there. And we're going towards also body language analytics, which is, of course, uh, also relevant. It's not just the facial expressions. So yeah, that's what I was mentioning about our foundation of diversity. And um, yeah, in terms of traction, so we have just won a grant to do research with the University of Houston. It's a, a EU grant called Next Generation Internet Explorer. It's about creating an AI, an internet which is human-centric, uh, which is sometimes forgotten. Uh, it's a great uh, research project, and we are in the pipeline of a DOD uh, application for a quarter million dollar on pain detection. We have two pilots uh, starting up, one in uh, Europe with Valeo, a spin-off of Valeo, in uh, measuring patient uh, emotions in hospital scenario, and with Better Manager, which is a coaching platform. And the big topic there is empathy. Could we understand uh, what is the empathy of a coach and how is it uh, affecting the outcome in terms of uh, user satisfaction, customer satisfaction of their coaching methodologies, and also to identify best practices that could be uh, replicated to other coaches. Thank you very much, Chandra. We are unfortunately out of time. We have two right. minutes. Yes. Yeah, sure. No Five minutes goes really fast. Okay. Two minutes from our jurors. Um, yeah. Uh, I would just have an, a question. You mentioned that your uh, that, that the solution is fully GDPR uh, um, compliant, but does that apply to all scenarios that you have showcased? Because because I'm just thinking on a scenario where my company would record uh, the, the the Zoom chat or whatever wh whatever it is, and would then store data on me uh, on on uh, I don't know if, uh, that that would be of some medical re relevance. Huh? For instance, yes. saying that I'm, I don't know I'm angry, I'm depressed, or whatever it is. Yeah. So that that would be uh, I think and. An, not in line with GDPR because you, you would then have an, a graph or store data on an employee and, and, and uh, that would relate to a medical state. Yeah, totally right. So uh, the fact is that, of course, GDPR doesn't say that you cannot collect data. It has to be informed consent and, and the users must be able to remove their data. But if everybody agrees to have their data collected individually, then we can do it. If people don't, then we do aggregation of data. So in the end, it's about what the customers want and what their end customers, their employees or, or patients uh, want. If they don't accept to have their individual data measured, then of course it's fine. We do not do it, of course. One more question. Hi, Chandra. Uh, nice to see you again. Uh, nice to see you. Um, uh, yeah, the, how about the, the, the creepiness factor? Because I mean, we, we've seen these technologies over the years. Uh, uh, the uh, Daniel Eck, you know, micro expression expert has licensed this technology to a number of firms. Uh, and we, we've seen Chinese uh, firms actually use these technologies. Mm -hmm. So the, obviously the potential for, for being really creepy is, is enormous. So uh, how do you address that? I, I think the, the, the let's say, the, the, the potential prospects you have uh, indicate that there are maybe areas where yep. it's more valuable than than just you know <laughs> creepy or dangerous. Yeah, I mean the creepy is of course uh, very subjective. I don't know what you call creepy if it's I'm looking at you and you look like relatively okay, <laughs> and you look at me. We are doing that as humans all the time with our own. With well, our it's own the bodies. intimacy. It's the intimacy, right? Uh, yeah, I mean here we're we're just a, a machine is doing what us humans do, and we keep the data, and we keep the data for what? And that's the big question I would say because the fact that we are measuring emotions is not new. We are doing it uh, in everyday interactions. I'm but anyway, sorry, it's a, we're completely yes. out of time. <laughs> it's uh, happy to have it uh, aside. This discussion anyway. So it's a hot topic. I agree with you. Thanks for your time, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Chandra. Big round of applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our morning session of the Mastermind Summit. So big round of applause again for all our startups and our jury members. We decoded the deep tech. We decoded unicorns today in the morning. So the winning startup of the deep tech category will be receiving 2,000 euros as well as a special prize from Eura Technologies, which is a partner of this category. One year support uh, with rent, 
a personalized follow-up provided by the Council of European Development and the National Institute for Research in Digital Science and Technology. So what are we going to see in the afternoon? We're going to unveil the greater region and you're also going to unveil acceleration and funding opportunities in the greater region. We're also going to discover the new startup Eldoradio in the United States. So go have a nice lunch and we'll see you back here at 2 p.m. Thank you very much. If you are a Luxembourg-based company looking for guidance towards new business opportunities abroad, potential partnerships, and information on all topics related to international trade, the International Affairs Department of the Luxembourg Chamber of Commerce is here to help you by offering you its decades worth of expertise, wide range of services, and tailor-made assistance both in Luxembourg and abroad. Our network of Luxembourg embassies and trade and invest offices, our integration in the Enterprise Europe network and our numerable partnerships with governments and trade agencies throughout the globe make us Luxembourg's most competent, reliable and best connected partner when it comes to developing and growing your business internationally. Speak with one of our advisors. Participate in our online or live events. Interact with experts and prospects or participate in our Be to Fair matchmaking events to continuously broaden your international knowledge and network on the world's biggest platforms and create profitable business opportunities. So if you wish to set foot in markets anywhere over the globe, get in touch with our International Affairs Department, your partner to go international.